Good morning. It's three minutes after ten. I do hope you're well. What do Alan Partridge, Emily Maitlis and Nigel Farage have in common, do you think? Uh, can you think of anything that Emily Maitlis, Alan Partridge and Nigel Farage have in common? Partridge and Farage, quite a lot in common, I think we could agree. Uh, although Pat Partridge is, is quite likeable. But where on earth does Emily Maitlis fit into this equation? I'll tell you. Emily Maitlis invented something or, or coined uh, a description of something that happened during the Brexit referendum called the Minford paradigm. And it refers to an economist called Patrick Minford, who uh, was pretty much the only established economist that you could find in the run up to that referendum vote who would argue from a position of some academic qualification that Brexit would be good for us economically. So because of the demands of false equivalence or balance or whatever you want to call it, by which the BBC has become increasingly hidebound in recent years, if you were working at the BBC and you needed a guest to counter the almost unanimous opinion of qualified economists that Brexit would be very bad for the British economy, then the call would go out to get Patrick Minford. And when you were presenting these programmes, you were never required or instructed or encouraged or possibly even allowed to say... I should just say that although we have two guests here offering conflicting opinions, one of them speaks for about 99% of the economic establishment and one of them speaks more or less exclusively for himself. You had to treat them as if they were equal and opposite authorities, as if their opinions were valid. The, the big echo would be with climate change, where on one hand you have almost every qualified scientist in the world, and on the other hand you had the late former Chancellor Nigel Lawson, who had no scientific qualifications whatsoever. Up to and including the August Radio 4 Today programme would invite Nigel Lawson on to argue with scientists about science that they had spent their lives studying. And so it was with Brexit. Patrick Minford is here to tell you things will be brilliant. He was, as if the man was not struggling enough with the reputational damage of Brexit reality, he was also known as Jacob Rees-Mogg's favourite economist. So there is that. That's why Emily Maitlis appears in the story. Nigel Farage appears in the story because among his many nonsenses, exaggerations, embellishments and lies during the run-up to the 2016 Brexit referendum, the idea that leaving the European Union would be good for the farming industry was, with the possible exception of the fishing industry, among the most egregious deceptions. You can put it down to opportunism, you can put it down to dishonesty, or you can put it down to ignorance. Although with Mr Farage, it's usually a fairly safe bet to conclude that his motivation would have been a combination of all three. Epic opportunism, weapons-grade dishonesty, and frankly extraordinary ignorance. So he sent out the message to farmers that Brexit would be good for them. On the other side of the um, uh, battlefield, if you will, were people who understood the issues. So on, on one side, you've got people like... Uh, uh, Nigel Farage, Patrick Minford, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, Andrea Leadsom, and all the rest of them. And on the other side, you had uh, well, pretty much everybody else. John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, you, 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 Ed, you, Michael Heseltine, anybody you want to think of, Rory Stewart, and, and, and some, but by no means all, farmers. And in the middle of that battlefield stood the farming industry. And for reasons that we will perhaps explore a little today... They elected in their droves, although not unanimously. It's hard to pin down precisely what their numbers were, but, but certainly they were higher. The, the ratio of farmers voting leave, the proportion of farmers voting leave was higher than the national result. It was higher than 52. Some of them think at about 60. And the decision they faced was which way to go. Do we run towards Nigel Farage and Jacob Rees-Mogg or do we run towards Michael Heseltine and Gordon Brown? And they elected to run in, in, in a majority towards, Michael, to, towards um, Nigel Farage and Jacob rees -Mogg. Where does Alan Partridge th fit into things? Well, one of Alan Partridge's most infamous episodes involved him managing to alienate pretty much every farmer in the country. And I'm very conscious of not wanting to do that today. Um, we will not be inviting, for example, Peter Baxendale Thomas 
onto the program to whom I could then say, if you see a lovely field with a family having a picnic and there's a nice pond in it, you fill in the pond with concrete, you plough the family into the field, you blow up the tree and you use the leaves to make a dress for your wife who's also your brother. That was Alan Partridge perhaps losing control of the situation slightly while interviewing a fictional farmer called Hugh Morris. So I don't want to alienate all of the... um, the farmers out there as well. Neither do I want to confine this conversation to the farmers. Let me deal quickly with Idiot's Corner, if I may. Um, There are also protests by farmers in European Union countries who are unhappy, I think, chiefly with two things, the requirements being imposed upon them to meet net zero requirements um, and the uh, facility being offered to particularly Ukrainian exporters to get their goods into the market at a lower price than the French or the uh, other foreign farmers feel that they can um, offer up their own produce. So it's a, so completely different issues. What they don't have is a problem selling to each other. Yes. So the United Kingdom situation is is specific and unique. Uh, I just while we're in idiot's corner, let's have a look at some ca- ca- capital letter stuff that's coming quite early. O'Brien, all in capitals, Brexit has not failed. It is a long-term change which can and will not work overnight. So go to Idiot's Corner along with Tarzan, suck it up, sour face, the Beaconsfield weirdo Emperor Khan and the rest of your snob remainers who think you are far superior than us plebs. You are not. It has been held back because of your constant whining and just cannot accept what's still all in capitals from John in Hartlepool and just cannot expect what the majority wished for. So get off your high horse or you might get pushed off. Give it 15 to 20 years and then look at it. Well, that would be fine if that's what you told us at the time, before the vote, if that's what you had said. Nigel Farage told farmers they would be better off. He told us that leaving the common agricultural policy would be uh, an improvement to the lot of of UK farmers. And guess who turned up at yesterday's protest in Parliament Square? Like I said, opportunism, ignorance, dishonesty. You choose the order in which you want to put them. I, I mean, if I told you that the man who credits himself with having done more to bring about Brexit than any other, and therefore done more to bring about the assault upon British farming, that people like well, Liz Webster, of course, known to this programme as Liz from Cricklade, was talking to Nick Ferrari about earlier, one of the organisers of last night's protest. If I told you that the man who had sold more lies to the farmers and fishermen of the United Kingdom than anybody else who has ever lived had the audacity to actually turn up at the protest last night, you'd think I was lying, right? You'd think, look, even Farage, I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him, but surely even he is not so twisted, self-obsessed and dishonest as to turn up at a farmer's protest and pretend he doesn't understand the role that he played in scuppering their entire profession. So my understanding is these are mostly Kent farmers, um, and there are lots of different issues here. There's cheap imports that worry them, there's late payments from the British government for the new agricultural scheme, Uh, There's a feeling that the countryside isn't really being supported. I think there's a whole mass of reasons. And what I'd like to know is, are there just one or two clearly defined issues? It's important to remember that leaving the common agricultural policy means we can't blame the European Commission anymore. It's totally in our hands. So I'm here to try and find out what what is it that really unites these people? I, you couldn't make it up, could you? And uh, unfortunately, I don't need to. So just, just just to pick two examples, cheap imports and late payments. Well, the payments weren't late under the common agricultural policy and the cheap imports weren't allowed. So what could possibly have created an environment in which cheap imports and late payments are crippling UK farmers? Hmm. Could it possibly have anything to do with leaving the organisation that was responsible for making payments on time and the regulatory framework that prevented cheaper imports from being brought into this country? And what I find extraordinary, and why I sometimes struggle to uh, muster up the sympathy for every single victim of the con men, as opposed to the uh, actual con men themselves, is that we were told this. Jacob rees well, what do you think he meant when he talked about cheap food for peasants? What do you think he was referring to when he said he'd be perfectly happy shipping in tons of hormone-injected beef from Australia? What did you think that would do to British beef farmers? When Patrick Minford talked about the necessity of running down manufacturing and agriculture in the way that we had run down coal and steel. I genuinely, and I don't know, and I'll never know, and I can't really imagine ever addressing the issue in an academic sense because I find it so impenetrable. What did people hear when the rest of us were hearing the truth? What did you hear? The fishermen, that poor woman in Lowestoft. Do you remember that woman in Lowestoft who who used to ring me all the time and shout at me about handbags? She ended up in Farage's political party. 
and now spends her life barking at the moon about the collapse of the fishing industry. What did these people hear when we were telling them the truth? What did they hear? Actually, let's stick that on the list. What did they hear? 0345 6060 When we were giving them the truth about what was going to happen to farming and to a lesser extent fishing, what did they hear? You remember when no deal was a possibility? Everyone was marching around with their pencils up their nose and their underpants on their, he- on their heads shouting, let's go WTO. That would have been even worse. Under WTO rules, every single producer on the planet would have been free to punt whatever the hell they wanted into this country without any checks, regulations or, or um, psychosanitary requirements in place whatsoever. What do you think they meant when they said we need to reduce red tape, we need to reduce regulation? They meant health and safety. They meant things that protect us. They meant that you're not allowed to sell us rancid old carcasses that are riddled with maggots because it's against the bloody law that we don't like. Do you know what red tape is? Law. And now you still have people like Rhys Mogg and, and to a lesser extent Gove complaining about the laws that are still in place because they are uh, EU laws. So this is as if they care more about whether a law smells a bit French than they do about whether or not it does a good job. So here's a law that prevents you from selling riddled cow carcasses at British markets. Oh, well, I think that's an EU law. We need to remember we didn't vote for Brexit in order to still abide by EU laws. Yes, but it would allow them to sell riddled cow carcasses at British markets. Yes, but it's a bit French, that law. Let them eat maggots. It's absolutely insane, isn't it? So question number one, and sometimes my questions are rhetorical because I don't know who can answer that question unless you're honest enough to admit that I'm talking about you. And you say, I'll tell you what I heard, James, and God knows how. I must have had gammon in my ears. But I heard when they said that British farming was going to get better, I, I, I just believed them, even though all of the people who knew what they were talking about said that it wouldn't. And it pains me to have to put farmers in capital letters, just to keep in the spirit of uh, John in Hartlepool. Uh, in capital letters, I have to put farmers near the very top of this list. Farmers seem to believe it more completely than anybody. Farmers had more to lose and more at stake than anybody else except the fishermen. Well, and the exporters and the universities. Um, I could go on. But farmers had more to lose than almost any other section of society, and yet they were queuing up to stick bloody great signs in their fields saying, vote Brexit. Everywhere you went in 2016, if you had the pleasure of driving through British countryside, it would be in some way sullied by seeing a whopping great trailer parked at the side of the road with vote Brexit on the side of it, or a picture of Nigel Farage with a pint pot on his head. The farmers seemed, and the statistics sadly support this to a point, the best efforts of people like Liz Webster notwithstanding, the farmers seemed to sign up for Brexit with more alacrity and enthusiasm than any other public-facing profession in the country. So that's question number two. Why? What did they hear? That applies to everybody who thought that they were going to get uh, an improved life. I suppose you're getting cheaper food. It's just not being um, held to the same standards of health and safety as the food that you have to pay a little bit more for. Um, the farmers, why? Why did farmers sign up for it? I think we need to be reminded, and you may need to be a farmer to answer that question. And then we come to the mother load. Then we come to the question that I don't think that we've asked before, but we will probably be asking again as the wheels turn and life moves on. We come to the question which in many ways poses the greatest challenge yet to the contempt for the con men, compassion for the con mantra. I've told you a few times that seeing those words on placards being waved in the sky at the People's Vote marches that I had the privilege of attending was one of the maddest moments of my entire career. There's this little collection of words that we came up with together on this little old radio programme, suddenly assuming a resonance that went way beyond the time that we spend together every day and which I have done my best, not always successfully, to subscribe to ever since. Some of the conned deserve contempt because they relish in being conned. If you are celebrating the unhappiness of farmers, for example, who voted Remain and are now struggling with the consequences of their colleagues' actions, then you, you deserve contempt. You, 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 you are profoundly unpatriotic. You have inflicted damage upon your own country while congratulating yourself on being a patriot. You are, to use a technical term, a complete plum. 
But other people who genuinely thought, because so many liars were lying to them, I, I could run you through the list of LBC presenters who encouraged you to vote for Brexit, people you're encouraged to trust, people that you perhaps sometimes think that they are the yin to my yang. Well, James thinks this and he thinks that, or James thinks that and she thinks this. So, oh, it's 52-48. It was never 52-48. It was 100-0. If you genuinely wanted to improve our economy or keep it roughly where it was, you voted to stay in. But farmers in their droves voted to come out. And today they want our sympathy. That's the question. Can you give it? I, because I, 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 can't, I, I, I'm not sure I can. And I, I don't like that. Content for the con man, compassion for, for the con has helped keep us sane at times during the last few years. But the farmers, they were so certain. So strident, so faragist in so many cases, even the ones that were relying on foreign labor to keep their fruit farms afloat. You remember some of the earlier reports that we covered of people going back to farmers that had been very, very pro-Brexit, who suddenly couldn't find anyone to pick their cabbages. Extraordinary uh, self-sabotage. What, what can you really? I'm not talking about all of them. Although I will take calls from Remain voting farmers if you can provide me with some insights into the motivations of your colleagues. So that would be questions number one and two. What did they hear and why did farmers vote for it? But the question the rest of us can answer, all of us can answer, can, do, do you feel, can, are, you better, are you a better person than me? Does your compassion extend to conned farmers today? Because by 11 o'clock this morning, I'd quite like to be on your side of this particular fence rather than my side. Because it's a cold and lonely place to refuse to feel sympathy for people who fell for it. But that was an astonishing noise that my stomach just made. It's because I'm talking about cabbages. I refuse. I, I, I don't want to be the person that doesn't feel sorry for farmers. I also don't want to do an Alan Partridge. But come on. Cry me a river. You got what you wanted. You were warned. You were told. You were unspeakably rude to the people who did their best to stop you from shooting your own foot off. And now you're driving your tractors around Parliament Square asking me to feel sorry for you. 0345 6060 973. Here's a farming analogy for you. Don't you reap what you sow. 24 minutes after 10, you reap what you sow, but also, of course, chickens come home to roost. Farmers are staging a tractor protest at Westminster last night over food security, something about which we all should care and do care. But is it too soon to respond compassionately to the farming industry's request for sympathy over a plight brought about in part, although not exclusively, by Brexit? And just, just, just because I, I, I love you really... A final word to Idiot's Corner. Yes, farmers in Europe are protesting as well about some issues, some of which are similar to the uh, issues that are being protested about here. But if they weren't in the European Union, their situation would be even worse. So you can't say, oh, look, over there, people in the European Union are unhappy as well. It's a bit like saying if you've got two broken ankles, that that person over there with one broken ankle proves that your broken ankles are not a consequence of you having fallen down the stairs. So that there, there it is. So just come on. I can only explain this so many times. There comes a point where you're choosing not to understand. Andrew's in Buntingford. That sounds like farming country, doesn't it? In Hertfordshire. Andrew, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. I suppose I, I was listening to the programme. I thought I really have to respond to this as a farmer. Go on. Uh, farmers in their droves voted for Brexit. I don't think, if you actually look at the uh, the voting intentions, they were that wildly different to the uh, you know the national population, the fifty two forty eight. It was near as sixty. Now, was it was near as sixty in favour, and about about okay. thirty against. And, and and they're not scientific figures, but uh, the, the, and obviously a lot of people didn't bother voting at all. But they were they were higher than the national average. Okay. Well, I was one of the farmers that voted to remain. I don't mind saying that, and I'm proud of that. <laughs> why and, would you? Why would you? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, you know, in a world that was difficult enough, why would you vote to make it more difficult? But well, my well, point exactly. is. I, I think in farmers' defence, the the administration at the time, the government of the day, said, mm. we will look after you. We will make sure that you are supported and the countryside and you pretty much carry on as you were. Now, being a cynic, 
Yeah. I never believed that for one moment. And so it has proved. But I think if you think back, James, very simply, yeah. we've had a whole generation of pop of politicians that really have only had to be part of policy forming in Brussels, and they've they've been implementers rather than instigators. And yes. you can you can debate the level that at which we chose to engage with Europe. The point is, all of well, a sudden, well, on, on on stuff like CAP, certainly when Margaret Thatcher was in Downing Street, we were very much leaders rather than followers. Well, absolutely, and and if you recall back, we actually had the president of the European Commission was an Englishman, one Henry Plum. Exactly that. Um, you know, you know, we were passionate supporters of it, and I don't know really what changed. To but it was never going to be. Our governments have got a track record of you know saying one thing and doing another, have they not? And it was never going to be the same on the, on ag policy. There's too many other interests, too many competing uh, land use requirements in the UK, a small country. Um, so I have a lot of sympathy with those farmers. Would I have gone and protested? Do you? No. Do, do you? But but I mean. Jacob Rees-Mogg said the other day, and we have to be a little bit wary of still treating her. I think one of the reasons why the country is such a mess is because people like him were treated with far more <laughs> respect than they will ever deserve. But he actually said out loud the other day, anything that makes trade more difficult makes countries poorer. And he thought that coming out of the biggest single market in the world would somehow not involve making trade more difficult. The level of stupidity required to, to end up at that conclusion... And then six years, seven years, eight years later, to, to, to describe your own stupidity without recognising that you're describing your own stupidity. That's, that's pond life level of stupidity. That's almost impossible to conceive levels of stupidity. That's done in Kruger effect in real time. Farmers aren't stupid. How could farmers have thought that making it harder to essentially do their jobs would be good for their livelihoods? And, and normally, mate... People are queuing up to tell me that they don't trust politicians. And in fact, the kind of people that tell me they don't trust politicians would be a little bit closer to your community as a farmer, perhaps, than to mine. The people who oh, don't trust them for this. And, and so the defence can't be, well, they told us we'd be all right. Certainly not the people in charge didn't tell farmers they'd be all right. People like Farage and Rees Mogg told them that they'd be all right, which is why I find it very hard to muster up much sympathy for them now, not unless they're contrite, not unless they're saying, sorry, we should never have voted for this, not unless they're going after the people that encourage them to do it, but they're not. You, you could apply that to, to the greater population about sort of recognising the mistake. I think probably, though, as recently as 2019, when dear old Boris was in uh, hmm. number 10, Boris said, you know, farmers, we've got your back, we will look after you. Now, <laughs> you, you can say that was an even greater level of naivety, but you can only, you can only actually take things at... Oh, you this, I, you're a, I think you're just a bit more, probably because it's your mates that we're talking about, you're just more generous than I am. I, I can't believe in 2023, <laughs> 2024 even, let's keep count at least, anybody would turn around and say, but Boris Johnson said we'd be all right. I rem actually, no, I had Minette Batters on the programme. I don't know if you heard it. And I said, are you really telling me that the entire future of the British farming industry depends upon you having faith in Boris Johnson's word? And she said, yes. And look where we are now. I, I can't but help agree, I'm afraid, James. So finally, because I'm sure you've got things to do, um, how many of your Brexit voting compadres rue the day? And how many of them are blaming it on, I don't know, me and Gary Lineker? I think if they're honest, they'll blame themselves. But I, w I would have said if you had a vote today, you'd probably be a 75-25, wouldn't yeah, you? What, yeah. I w I would, that's my guess. No, I, well, I, I think I know it might be interesting to see what it would be in, specifically in your, in your world as well. Andrew, thank you. So you speak to someone like Andrew, but he's a Remain voting farmer and he makes you feel a little bit bad. But honestly, you expect me to feel sorry for the people who had the bloody great signs in their fields telling everyone to vote? Because you'd have thought farming would have been... Such a powerful lever for Remain. So, look, I'm cross with David Cameron, who was pathetic. I'm cross with Jeremy Corbyn, who didn't turn up. But they, they left the field clear, if you pardon the pun, for the Farages and the Reese Moggs, the Leadsoms and the Dorries, to talk undiluted gibberish. And, of course, supported by people in this profession, by the Daily Mail, by the Daily Telegraph, by the Sun, by the Mail on Sunday. Pretty much you name it. And here we are today. No, no, no pleasure in I told you so. There hasn't been for years. But can you feel sorry? Tell me why I should feel sorry for the farmers. 0345 6060 973. My third farming analogy of today. Can you feel sorry for the turkeys who voted for Christmas? Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines.
10.35 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, 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 I wonder whether I'm falling into a trap this morning of, of seeing farmers as part of the problem rather than victims of the, of the broader con. Listen to this from George Eustace, not only a far, for farming minister, I think, at the time. In fact, he's the perfect storm, isn't he, of, of um, the clash between Brexit and farming because he is a farmer from a farming background, and he was a former UKIP candidate, so he's got Farage's fingerprints on his shoulders, and he ended up a farming minister, the kind of tin pot politician who managed to achieve promotion in the f- absolute carnage that followed the country's vote to become the first population in the history of humanity to vote to impose economic sanctions on itself. And here he is. EU regulations make life hard for the UK's farmers. If we have the courage to vote leave and take back control, we would be free to think again and could achieve so much more for farmers and our environment. I think Eustace is one of the countless Tories, indeed one of the countless Brexit supporting Tories who are quitting politics altogether at the next election rather than hang around to face either the judgment of the people or the consequences of the con that they sold to the British people. So far- farmers, do they really deserve? I don't know. I'm trying to talk myself out of it. Sympathy or deserve to be treated differently from other sections of the society that voted to leave. I don't know. But here's that little exchange I had with Minette Batters in 2019 that the last caller, well, he wasn't referring to it. He referred to people believing Boris Johnson. I think the days of me feeling sorry for people who believed but Boris Johnson are behind us. But, but maybe, and I was one of them once for about a fortnight in 2008, but maybe in 2019 it was still forgivable to think that Boris Johnson might have been telling the truth. My job is to represent farmers and and make sure that their case is is heard by government. And, you know, it's not just about um, George Eustace in in all of this. The prime minister has made cast iron. We keep we keep coming back to this. And I am going to, I'm afraid, remind you that he made cast iron guarantees to the people of Northern Ireland and business people in Northern Ireland about the likelihood of there being any border put in the Irish Sea. So where are you deriving your confidence that he'll keep his promises to you? Well, he is he is the Prime Minister, and my job is to hold him to account. He was Prime I Minister will... when he promised there'd be no checks on, on trade with Northern Ireland from the Great Britain mainland. He was, but this is where the, the power of the people is so important. You yes. know, the people have put him into that place. They've got a massive majority government. The people of this country drew a line in the sand last year when over a million people in two weeks um, signed up to this and said they wanted trade to be fair, They wanted food imports uh, to be produced to the same standards. I don't believe they will ever, ever forgive him if he reneges on that commitment. And and we see um, a mass departure of farmers in our countryside. So he has to keep to his word. Um, And, you know, I certainly intend to keep um, banging the drum and making sure that he does. Now, of course, that is his decision. Yes. Um, But we, we really do need to make sure that this is done right. And I think after COVID, you know, so many people have enjoyed walking in the countryside. So many people have only been able to cook. They've been buying out of yes. retail. They haven't been able to go to the hotels and pubs and restaurants that we normally do. And they value their food and they want to make sure that farmers in this country can possibly even produce more food so that we're not reliant on other countries on shipping food right the way across the world while we put our own farmers out of business. That would be a dereliction of duty by any prime minister. And and I hope this one will stick to his commitment. But I share your concerns uh, of the past. And and in in, in conclusion, then, you are in many ways that the the future of British farming depends upon Boris Johnson's ability to keep his word to you. It certainly does. It certainly does. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, oh, indeed. The future of British farm. Now, this is the president of the National Farmers Union in about 2021, actually, a little, a little later in the day. So there's uh, some compelling evidence that farmers are being slightly misrepresented when it is, um, uh, it's a good article in West Country Byline Voices that makes the case for them not being particularly disproportionately in favour of Brexit, despite some uh, unsci- unscientific polling that suggested they were. Um, but I wonder how many voted for Boris Johnson in 2019, as opposed to... Jeremy Corbyn, you see. So that makes you feel sorry for the farmers again. Uh, Hobson's choice that we all faced in 2019. If you were a farmer, you probably would have led towards the the 
um, uh, inconceivably morally corrupt character rather than the inconceivably incompetent character. And No Hostages is giving me a bit of a lesson today as well. I always take my medicine, if you serve it up politely. Didn't Kidderminster vote leave, James? And most people in your age bracket voted leave too. If we expect young people to feel sympathy for pension-aged victims of Brexit and people in foil, for example, to feel sympathy for victims in Boston, then farmers get our sympathy too. Um, not everybody agrees. Uh, Donald says, I was working near Oxford, drove past the jingoistic pro-Brexit side every day, made me feel sick every time I saw it. I have absolutely no sympathy for Brexit voting farmers. Slightly different question from the one that I asked, which was sympathy almost for all farmers. But I don't know. Does it sound childish if I, if I say I just want them to admit they were wrong? I just want them to say sorry. Dana is in Maida Vale, not farming country anymore, although it was once. What would you like to say, Dana? I think you're absolutely spot on. I don't think we should be feeling any sympathy for farmers. I think all farmers that I've ever met... <laughs> pretty No, I mean, okay. I do know people who are farmers. Yes, of course. And they are pretty astute. They were receiving huge subsidies from the European Union to farm yes. or not farm or for their sheep or whatever. And by voting leave, what did they think was going to happen? I don't know, you so see. The, the government was never going to replace the EU funding they were receiving. Didn't matter what the government, what anybody told you. I mean, common sense alone told you that we would not be able to pour in the billions that the EU was pouring into British farming. I, well, I, I, maybe. So why, but... if, if you're then going to vote yes, leave, gosh. you deserve to be poorer. You actually voted not to take money from the EU. So why are you upset? Well, you know why they're upset, because they thought they were buying a, a, a toaster, and when they opened the box, it had bricks in it. And, and, I, and in those circumstances, I looked to how persuasive the salesman was, rather perhaps to how gullible the purchaser was. So I think, and I don't know that you'd disagree with this, Donna, sh surely this analysis extends to everybody who voted for Brexit and found out that it's actually made life worse for them, not better. You're not singling well, farmers I, out for, for particular criticism. I think um, the reason I think farmers are in a slightly different category yeah. is that they were actually being paid by the EU. Yeah. Whereas most people were not being paid by the EU. The, the common agricultural policy was, was very helpful to farmers. And, so um, if you're, you know, if, it's like some saying, I don't want pocket money to your parents and then saying, but I've got no money to spend. Yes. So, really, I don't understand why farmers deserve sympathy. They knew where their money is coming from. They knew they were voting to cease receiving that money. So... My, well, well, I, 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 my pendulum is swinging this morning, Donna, quite, quite violently, and, and my natural instinct is different from yours. I, I very much subscribe to contempt for the con men, compassion for the con, but Andy suggests it needs to become contempt for the con men, compassion for the contrite. And you, I, I wonder whether you'd agree with that or whether you feel well, that... I think, for, I think the truth is that most farmers, I don't know what they thought, right? No. I have no idea what they thought. But I think if they had to vote again, they'd realise they had just voted for Christmas. And yet Nigel Farage <laughs> turned up at this protest yesterday and didn't get um, muck spread, which, frankly, if the I farmers were paying I don't attention... Understand. I think people are reluctant to admit they've made a mistake. Well, we're all reluctant to admit we've made mistakes, I suppose, in, in most circumstances. But to be surveying this mess and thinking, yes, that was definitely the right thing to do back in 2016 pushes the limits of my credulity to breaking point. But, but you know, Freddie says, I can't believe the leopards would eat my face, says the farmer who voted for the leopards who eat faces party. But I don't know, to be honest, whether or not this is a fair analysis, whether you single out farmers. I think, do you know, I think the emotional impact of those signs in those fields was, was, was for me at least, it was huge. I spent a lot of time in Norfolk, heavily, heavily pro-leave, uh, and loads of signs, signs everywhere. And that's also where I had that experience with the bloke in red trousers on the seafront in Wells Next to Sea. Do you remember that? Who sort of marched up to me and started telling me to vote leave. And, and, my, and I never get involved with stuff like this when I'm off air. I, I always very politely say, you must give me a ring on the show. or you know. And on this occasion, I, I, I could see my wife crossed the road and went into the ice cream parlor because she could see I was going to engage with him just on the question of Northern Ireland. I think he was a farmer, certainly a landowner. 
Uh, so it's all going to be great. So, oh, don't worry about that. Everything will be fine. I said, What's going to happen in Northern Ireland? Do you think? How are they going to How are they going to deal with the fact that the Good Friday Agreement kind of demands that the regulations in Northern Ireland are exactly the same as the regulations in Ireland, and the regulations in Ireland are the regulations that are EU regulations, and you want the United Kingdom to be outside EU regulations? What's going to happen to Nor- Oh, don't you worry about that. Oh, it'll be absolutely fine. I, I, I mean, I, oh dear, I wonder, I wonder where he is now. Is he contrite? Is, or is he sorry? Or is he blaming it all on Gary Lineker? It is 10 minutes to 11, and this, this, is, uh, this is helpful. You, you, you don't have to feel sympathy, but you do have to offer support. If we don't get the farming industry in finer fettle, then we will be subject to all manner of grim imports that stand up to a, 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 a tiny fraction of the requirements that we've become used to in this country. Food security being a key driver of yesterday's protests in Westminster, and food security being threatened by um, uh, trade deals, for example, that allow imports of food produced to standards that would be illegal in the UK. So British farmers being held to higher standards than the farmers in countries that Liz Truss and now Kemi Badenoch claim that they're signing trade deals with. Trade deals that couldn't have happened unless, of course, we'd left the European Union. So I like that. Quite a few of you picking up on that distinction. You have to feel sorry. You don't have to feel sorry for them, but you do have to support them. In which case, I find myself feeling a bit paternalistic. Because you just just take some responsibility for what you've done. Would you please? Uh, You know, stick a bloody great sign in your field saying, rejoin now. Or, or, in fact, as Liz Westberg told... Nick, this morning, you need to realign with EU regulations in order to support farmers. You support them up to a point. EU farmers are still unhappy. But in in order to improve the lot of British farmers, the main organiser of last night's protest said we need to realign with EU regulations. Why wouldn't they do that? Because people like Jacob Rees-Mogg would spit their dummies out. So so I I, I wonder whether the farmers need to pick slightly better targets. 10.51 is the time. Steve is in Barnum in Yorkshire. Steve, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, I'm slightly seething at your last caller, saying that farmers got loads of subsidies and everything. Well, some did. Well, no. Generally speaking, everybody got a, a percentage per got a payment per acre. But if you look at it in real terms, we now pay seven percent to eight percent of our income in food for this country. When in the sixties and seventies, it was thirty-five percent. And if you go back even further, it would be sixty odd percent. These these are two things can be true at the same time. The the, the common agricultural policy saw subsidies for farmers and at the same time that that's been taken away at a period for farmers where supermarkets have been scalping them no no james no no james you've got to stop there okay they haven't been taken away in we're all we're in demographic the scotland they have their own way of sorting it out wales has its own way no the England common agricultural policy no longer yes, applies yes. to the united kingdom and one of the key okay. complaint one of the key complaints of the farmers last night was that they weren't getting as much as they used to get and what they were getting was coming late those are direct consequences of leaving the common agricultural policy which was a direct consequence of being in the european union we haven't james james you're misunderstanding. I, I can't am, say everything, James. No, that's because, all right. Go on, finish. Because, <laughs> because our, our subsidy has been phased out, but they're now phasing in, it's called an FSI, which is an environmental situation. And we are able to get, some people can get as much as the old subsidy, some probably get half as much. Yes. Well, but, I understand but, it perfectly. But the, stamp, but, but the stamp has now come down just the other day, yesterday, I believe, where they want people to put to take out of production no more than 25%. So they're going to pay people to put wildflowers and legumes in and all that situation. Now, what farmers voted leave for, really, was they wanted rid of the red tape. What red I tape? voted remain. What red yeah, tape? Red, red tractor was one of them, red tractor. But it was an English invention. We have our, our own situation. We started ourselves. The NFU started it. Minette Bather started it. And it started to take so, over. Listen, I, I, you're suggesting, and you speak about your... Uh, Brexit voting colleagues, you don't speak as one of them, but they they thought that things they found cumbersome had been imposed upon them by European Union membership when they hadn't actually no, been... No, no, it wasn't European, it was no, our I, own. No, I, no you've got to let me finish. You keep interrupting me and telling me I don't understand things, and if I get to the Go end of the then. sentence you'll realise that I do. So the red yeah. tractor was not imposed upon them by the European Union, but but they thought it was and they voted to get rid of it. There is some stupidity there, James. I'll but give that's, you that what, that's what you're describing. I'm just checking that I'm understanding you correctly, No, that's Steve. OK. I tried to tell people. Right. I, they said 
the government said they'd look after us, and I said, no, they won't. Uh, Just the same as your last, rem- your last remaining farmer said. Yeah. I said, no, they won't look after us. But in reality, James, we're getting this $2.9 billion going to farming, and, the env- and now it's called the environment. Mm. So we're supposedly still to get the same amount as we got when we were in the CA, when it was the CAP. But it's in a different form. And, and different it doesn't, mode. and you're not addressing the trade deals that, that farmers last night claimed allowed food produced to standards that are illegal in the UK to be imported into. Well, in- we don't exactly have too many trade deals going on at the moment because they haven't really started yet. What their problem is, is red tractor again, where everything we sell has to be red tractored, monitored. We pay for it to be red tractored, assured, and it goes into the mills. Now, then, that mill will have a pile of oil, seed, rape, wheat, whatever. But from, it will come in from other countries, and it hasn't been red tracted, and it's called gatekeepers. Well, it's held to and lower just, standards, but that wasn't exactly. true. But that wasn't true before. <sighs> to a degree, it had to well, have been. Like, I mean, we've, in, we've in a way, you're saying that the farmers who were protesting last night didn't really know what they were protesting about. No, they're protesting about because we've left the union now. Yes, we've got to fight for ourselves. And the red tractor is in, and no, the red tractor. But the organizer of the entire event said that we need to realign with EU regulations immediately. That's what the protest was about, Steve. That means we don't have imports from other countries. But where do you get? But James, produced where do you to, get your, produced to lower, sta- lower standards, from? and you can't. We can't gloss over this. I speak to her on a regular basis. The main reason for the protest was to realign with EU regulations. Don't understand that whatsoever, James. Well, I'll explain it to you, if you'd let me. It would mean that the countries with which Liz trade would mean that, well, you, you know how much beef has been exported to Australia since we signed that trade deal, right? How much British beef? Yeah, is, do you peanuts, know? I presume. How much? Peanuts, I presume. No, nope, not, not that much, Steve, not that no, much. That's nothing, nothing. Yeah, there. absolutely nothing. And the beef coming in the other direction is already flowing and, and rising. And it is, I, 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 according to some analyses, it is going to be farmed under standards that you wouldn't be allowed to farm beef here so so that is a and, and boris johnson and liz truss who i presume you voted for boris johnson did you no i did not vote right. for them i, right. I presume your mates did uh, the, I, all, I get, all, I get, all i get all i get all i get is the is the <laughs> farmers the exceptions to the rule i never get the rules ringing in anymore i need the well, rules I don't, not... no, I don't know many too many who voted for it james for, they well, i had the it. president of the nfu on the program saying the whole future of british farming depends on boris johnson keeping his word and that's the risk that she took and here that we are now that was the import but can I just say one thing? Of course you can. Soya bean, Jim. We, can't, we don't grow soya bean in Europe. We don't grow it. It's in South America and America, isn't it, soya bean? I don't know. And probably in Australia, yes. I presume so, But we, yes. consume, we consume large amounts of it. Only 3% is grown for animal produce in the first place. Yes. The rest of the animals consume it as a byproduct of humans. So the soya bean situation in the world is a, a misnomer. But... I don't, I've never mentioned. Why are you telling me about soya beans? No, because because yeah. this trade, the trade deals you're trying to imply on me, we had these all before. No, we didn't. And the, and soya, I, I, we categorically didn't. I don't so think what you've soya, just said about soya beans is true anyway. But well, the trade well, deals, soya bean, we consume large amounts of soya bean in Europe. I, 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 listen, soya beans isn't my field of expertise, and it isn't yours either. No, but that is an import. Well, I, it might import. well be in it, but I'm not talking about I mean, soya beans. No, but they're saying they went I'm talking about the trade deal that she Europe. signed with Australia, claiming that it was going to change the world, and Kemi Badenoch marching around yes, the country it's saying absolute, that... Uh, it's absolute rubbish. Yes, I know that, and you know that. I know that, and you know that, but all these bloody farmers with the vote leave signs in their field don't seem to understand it yet. Well, I don't really think there's that many that voted leave. All right. Not that many at all. All right. What, what, what do you need most overnight to improve your situation as a farmer in East Yorkshire? Well, here we go then. Yeah. In 1984, James. No, I just give me a wheat. short answer, no, Steve. No, no, Honestly, you, haven't need, you got cows to we milk? Need, we need. I've got, I'm lambing. <laughs> we need. We need. And the hoofers of the hoofers. Yes. Have, have uh, stopped the Australians sending ships up the Panama Canal, and they can't get into Europe with the lambs from Australia. I, 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 so yeah, now can the you, price you, of lambs can, gone sky high. Can, can you just answer the question? What do I need? Yeah. I need people to realise they've got to pay more for food. Well, there it is. So, well, soybeans come mainly. A lot of soy comes out of Ukraine, apparently. No, well, we, but it's mostly it's from America. So all so them saying they want to align so here's with the our thing. imports doesn't work well, because we imported from Australia and America. We imported from America, 
All right. I, I, some, some, when, when, when people, you can rewind, by the way, on Global Player and listen back to this conversation. I'm sure elements of it have, have, have made sense. You, you clearly know what you're talking about in some areas, Steve, with respect. I do too. And in other areas, I don't. And in other areas, perhaps, perhaps you don't either. But all of the people, Shuffle, well, all of the people who voted for Brexit because they thought they were going to get cheaper food, they're the real problem yeah. here. Because it couldn't yes. really get any cheaper unless you started allowing stuff that was either undesirable or unsafe to be sold in British shops and supermarkets. It can't get any cheaper. It, can't it cannot get, get any cheaper because any we cheaper. can't live. The subsidy was there to help us keep supporting. In 1984, wheat well, was £140 and a back ton. To the subsidy. And now it's 170 James. We can't, we started. We've had a, We've had, that's it, the subsidy's there to help us keep producing it. It should be £600 a tonne. And that's that's a conversation that no politician seems prepared to have. I've had a text that's off. I've had a text off Robert Steve. He says, "You and this farmer make a great double act. Are you busy after <laughs> lambing?" <laughs> Very well, James. We Very could, good, James. We could go on tour. It's eleven o'clock. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, I, and yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, there it is, the question of whether or not this particular section of society... I, I, you see, even that, that lady in Lowestoft used to ring in all the time and shout at me about handbags. I even felt sorry for her, even as she was joining Nigel Farage's party. And, and you sit there going, I promise you, he's not someone you should be trusting with the future of the Lowestoft fishing industry. He doesn't care about anybody except himself, and he's incapable of giving a... He can't even lie straight in bed. He turned up last night at the farmers' protest. It's extraordinary. There's just something visceral about food production, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't, shouldn't be treated any differently. So I now go back to feeling content for the common, compassion for the contrite. Four minutes after 11. Um, I think that the uh, conversation about Israel has moved from speculation to conclusion, hasn't it? Benjamin Netanyahu's course has damaged the country's standing in the world. It has diminished the support and affection that, that many others in the world feel for Israel. And it has happened, really. It's been sacrificed, really, at the altar of his vanity and ambition. The United Nations Security Council passed its first ceasefire resolution last night, in which it demanded that the fighting halt for the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. The United States abstained and declined to specify a timeline for the release of the hostages kidnapped on October the 7th, which suggests that they finally recognize the, um, it's very important to get the words right, uh, not necessarily the impossibility, but they recognize the jeopardy that Netanyahu's attempts to tie together the destruction of, of Hamas, the release of all the hostages, with the cessation of hostilities against Palestinian civilians it was doomed never to, um, never to happen. He's cancelled a visit to by Israeli officials to Washington. David Cameron, it's extraordinary the angle that the Daily Telegraph takes on this. The, the, the United Kingdom um, helped pass the first UN Security Council resolution for calling for a ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza conflict. I'm going to say that again, actually, because many, many people feel, rightly or wrongly, that the United Kingdom, that the Conservative government and the Labour opposition have done too little too late when it comes to calling for ceasefire in Gaza. And and yet, when they finally get around to doing it, the Daily Telegraph chooses to report it as a Tory backlash as Britain votes for unconditional Gaza ceasefire. Extraordinary, really, to reflect that this is a report built upon the idea that four Conservative MPs challenged Lord Cameron behind closed doors at a 1922 committee meeting. So the United Kingdom actually endorses a UN resolution that passes calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. And the Daily Telegraph chooses to lead on the idea or on the news, in inverted commas, that four Tory MPs complained to the UK Foreign Secretary about that decision. It, it's actually bizarre now where this story has gone. And the reason why it is so bizarre is because people can't make head nor tail of what's happening now because they believed so much of what they were told about what was happening then. If you were listening to this program, you're probably all right because we have managed, and it hasn't always been easy, but we have managed to successfully record repulsion, repulsion, profound, pr profound repulsion. I mean, there are no words to describe our reaction to the events of October the 7th. 
uh, unqualified. Possibly some people were unhappy with the lack of qualification of support for Israel and its right to respond. And then the slow, well, it started slowly and then gathered pace, fear that what Benjamin Netanyahu was doing was going to cause untold carnage in Gaza and untold damage to Israel. I have to confess that I never thought Donald Trump would publicly come out with that argument. Um, but I suppose even a stop clock is right twice a day. Joe Biden has gone there. Um, the United Nations went there some time ago, although the setup, the constitutional setup of the United Nations meant that motions could be blocked, most recently, of course, by Russia and by China. But there we are now. Uh, the, the United Nations has called for an unconditional ceasefire in Gaza. And Benjamin Netanyahu is throwing his toys out of his pram. He's also waving goodbye to um, uh, one of the parties that propped up his coalition, a, a right-wing political party that was propping up his coalition. Um, America abstained. So uh, that, that described in Israel by Netanyahu's officials as hurting Israel's war effort. So, so we've reached another moment. We've reached another grim moment in this horrible story. And it's the moment at which Israel is on its own. Completely isolated now. It's gone from having the, uh, uh, well, uh, you could say extraordinary, perhaps unique levels of support in America and the UK chiefly. It was never quite the same in other countries, but you could probably say Europe and America frankly, extraordinary levels of support in Europe and America, certainly if you looked at it through a Middle Eastern lens. And Benjamin Netanyahu has rendered Israel alone on the world stage. And that, it, it, listen, even if you don't have sympathy for, for Israel, even if you have questions about its right to exist, in which case I, I think you need to give your head a wobble personally, but for the, for the, for the Jewish state to have been cut loose from the international community by the Israeli Prime Minister. I, 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 I mean, I've got no skin whatsoever in this game. But I find that quite scary. That's what Netanyahu's done. And, you know, having been able to see it coming is no comfort whatsoever. Having been able to describe to you that this was bound to happen unless something pretty significant and almost impossible to describe, almost indescribable happened. This was bound to happen. This trajectory has been clear since probably November or December of last year. And, and you know, I know I, I do sometimes need to offload on you. Sometimes it probably seems a bit daft or a bit self-indulgent, but sometimes I do need to offload on you. Uh, sometimes it's really difficult conducting these conversations. I, you know, I can joke about Idiot's Corner, but there are some accusations that are not caring about dead Palestinian babies or, or hating Jews. The, the, some of the accusations that come in, they don't, that I don't, I hope they don't stop me from having the conversations. But um, uh, you, there are some sort of allegations or, or accusations that do hurt. And some people who have public profiles. Have, have done it as well. I don't think it would be appropriate to, to single them out by name, although I reserve the right to do that, I, and I may change my mind. Uh, and I'll use my public platform to call them out in the way that they use theirs to, to call me out. But this stuff resonates. This stuff lands, you know. And the idea that you would be called anti-Semitic for simply explaining that what is now happening was going to happen is extraordinary. It's like calling somebody anti-Semitic for explaining that the sun was going to come up tomorrow. This, this has been inevitable since it became clear that there was no answer to the question of how much is too much. And sometimes a phone-in show can seem a bit simplistic or it can seem a bit crass, but it's not, you know. But when we get it right together, because I can nothing without you, when we get it right together, we can distill really complicated issues right down to the crucial questions, to the bare bones of the issue. And that was the question that we probably should have spent even more time examining three, four months ago. How much will be too much? Because the people ringing me to tell me 
or in terms, although they'd never say it quite explicitly, people would ring me and essentially refuse to acknowledge the notion that there was a that there was a possibility of too much being too much. It, there can't be too much. We have to carry on until Hamas has been eradicated and the hostages have been released. And you'd say yes, but you you, you almost begin to sound like a coercive partner in that situation. It's like, I, I won't stop hitting you until something over which you have no control happens. Uh, you know, the, the, the people being killed in the Gaza Strip have absolutely no agency in the question of whether or not the hostages get released. And Hamas being destroyed as you continue to arguably undertake the biggest imaginable recruiting program in the history of the Middle East seems to be an utterly unachievable goal. So you're left today with a conclusion that has been clear for some time, but which I have been reluctant to articulate. And, and that is that I don't think Netanyahu was telling the truth. I, I think that the, the fact that today's or last night's call for a ceasefire is unconditional is the point at which the world has recognized, the, 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 or the world has acknowledged, it may have recognized it long ago, acknowledged that the uh, Israeli conditions are unachievable, that Netanyahu's conditions for, for, for cessation of hostilities are unachievable. It is an unscorable goal. It will never happen. God, you have to hope the hostages get released, but the eradication of Hamas? Not a chance. And how many hostages have been killed as a consequence of the bombardment of Gaza? We will probably never know. So if you struggled to understand what that meant, you were right. But if you'd said so out loud, you'd have been called anti-Semitic. Until today, when everybody's saying it. I mean, literally everybody. America abstaining and the UK voting for a Security Council resolution at the United Nations demanding a ceasefire, an unconditional ceasefire for the duration of the holy month of Ramadan. I presume that Israel will ignore it, and I don't know what that will mean or what that will signify or what that will entail moving forward. Um, but I do know that that is probably the loneliest Israel has been on the world stage. And I haven't got the history to say this with certainty, but certainly in all the time that I've been doing this job, this is the loneliest Israel has been on the world stage since the country was founded. And it's all on Netanyahu. How do you process that? I think the question is, how does it end? 03456060973. And this, I think, will demand degrees of knowledge and understanding that are a little bit above average. How does it end? How does it end? Because you could see Netanyahu continuing down this path if he retained the support that um, he presumably was relying on. Although, again, I, I mean, did he know that this was going to happen? Surely he's been warned. Biden would have warned him publicly. Never mind what was being going on in private. Chuck Schumer, the most... Senior Jewish politician in the whole of the United States of America used the word pariah two weeks ago. I did the, the I did, you know, look, sometimes I pat myself on the back for correctly predicting the direction of traffic in political affairs. A, this is too important to, to, to be engaging in that kind of conduct. And B, it, it was really, really obvious, unless your scarf was tied so tightly around your neck that, that you couldn't see the wood for the trees. This was so obviously going to happen. Netanyahu was so obviously not going to change course, partly because to do so would have been opening himself up to not just defenestration, but, but prosecution in Israel. The longer he can sustain hostilities, the longer he can evade justice on really simple terms. Loading his cabinet with people who call for things like nuclear bombs to be dropped on the Gaza Strip. How can anybody today be surprised by where we've ended up, except perhaps passionate supporters of Israel, the, the my country right or wrong level of support, who must be reeling today to discover that Netanyahu has cut you loose from the international support structure that has sustained you for decades. So how does it end? 03456060973. And I don't know 
if you've been four square behind Netanyahu up until this point, whether you still are or not, I, I don't know whether you're ready to talk about this yet, or, or indeed whether you're ready to acknowledge reality, or, or whether you are um, in, in a form of denial about what he has done to your country, or what he has done to Israel. You may, you may be a dual citizenship, you may have a a sort of filial or religious affiliation to, to, to Israel rather than a citizenship one. But you, you, you know what I mean by that phrase. Look at what he's done now. Look at what he's done. So how does it end? And also, how does it feel? How does it, how does it feel? 03456060973. The latest resolution restored the word permanent to the original submission and was passed due to no objections. The chamber in New York broke into applause after the vote. So that, in a sense, is the whole world clapping. Uh, the call for a ceasefire, which until relatively recently, many supporters of Israel would describe as uh, somehow offering up support for Hamas. It's weird, isn't it? How quickly the scales can fall from your eyes sometimes. How, how, how have we ended up here? And how on earth does it end? 0345 6060 973. How can you say that it is all on Hamas, James? Um, <laughs> I didn't. I said that the, 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 the state of Israel, the, the cutting loose of Israel by the rest of the world is, is all on Netanyahu. And yet, Without the Hamas attack of October the 7th, Netanyahu would never have been able to do what he's done. So I, I, you can share the responsibility if you want. But the question of how we got here, and much, much more pertinently, how the hell it ends, is one that we will not be able to answer definitively, but we will at least try. 0345 6060 973 is the number that you need. And I, I mean, if, if this was a private conversation rather than a public one, I, it would be a little, it would have elements of the last hour, you know, or the, the context and the content is completely different. How the heck could you not see what was going to happen? Is the question that I've got boiling in the back of my How could you not see that this was going to happen? So busy throwing around your, your hurtful accusations and your meaningless phrases. Your ludicrous alligator. How could you not see that this is where he was taking you? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. It's 20 past 11. 24 minutes after 11, the Times analysis, that's uh, the London Times, states that Benjamin Netanyahu and President Biden are on a collision course that will end when one of them leaves office. So there's the first answer to the question of how, how does this end, although that's only partial, isn't it? The crisis between the pair, which has been building for weeks over the war in Gaza, ruptured again when the US abstained on a vote in the United Nations Security Council that called for an immediate ceasefire. Um, how do you think it ends? And if you can, if you want, how, how, how did it end up here? How did, how did Netanyahu manage to take Israel to a place where it has been essentially cut loose by the rest of the world? For now, at least. I, I, these things are never permanent. Matt's in Hull. Matt, what would you like to say? Hello, oh, James. We've, we've spoken before about uh, Trident okay. uh, quite a while ago and the fact that it wasn't a, a deterrent. But uh, I think the only way that it can happen now, it's become so entrenched, is for the UN to actually impose uh, a settlement where they would recognise Palestine as a state and make it a full UN member. Uh, you would have to go back to the 1967 borders, probably. Uh, you would have to remove the settlements from the West Bank, and you would have to put UN peacekeeping troops in well, there. Well, that's never going to happen, is it? Well, it's happened before. You know, I mean, we've done it in Africa, we've done it in Southeast Asia, we've done it in the Middle that's East before. So, I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, you, I don't know quite what the word is to describe that. I'm not sure that that imposition would be tolerated by Israel. Almost certainly not, but I mean, what, what's the alternative? Just letting it rumble on forever, and you know, I mean, it, uh, it's yes. almost as though. That, I mean, that that is probably if this was a, a a vote, I think that would probably get the majority support, wouldn't it? In terms of what people think, not what people want. Yeah, and also the UN resolution. I mean, there's already countless UN resolutions in place, you know, saying that any extension beyond the 67 borders is illegal, and that you know the settlements in the West Bank are illegal, and. Yeah, you know, they're just ignored because usually America uh, backs 
you know, vetoes things and, you know, the, the first few attempts at a ceasefire mm. were vetoed by America. Then they proposed a very, very watered down yeah, but that's the point. One. That's the point, isn't it? The, 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 uh, I mean, if they can't even offer up support for the relatively modest measures that they yep. have rejected, the idea of, and without America behind any of this, none of it's ever going to happen, the idea that they would develop an appetite for what you're describing is, is beyond... Uh, well, yeah, I mean... It's as you beyond say, it's all, become, all plausibility, isn't it? Yeah, I think the shift in the American position, though, is, uh, as you, you know, it's pretty obvious to anyone that Israel is extraordinarily isolated, but America is becoming isolated because they were the only nation yeah. strongly back in Israel. So the shift is more the effect upon America, not some revelation that, you know, this has to stop in Gaza. It's the fact that the uh, Americans are suffering. But this is, this is the tail wagging the dog in a sense. This is, this is the public opinion and some of the numbers in the primaries that Joe Biden will have seen may have played a part in his um, thought process. Yeah, particularly in Michigan, yeah. But, um, uh, yes, it, particularly in Michigan. But, but, it, but it's still real. Do you, do you see what I mean? Even if there's a cynicism in some of Biden's cal- calculations rather than a, a, you know, an unerring moral compass that's, that's spinning, he, he is catching up with public opinion. So, and, and this is terrible for supporters of Israel. It couldn't actually be worse because now yeah. the most powerful politicians on their side yeah. are buckling, arguably, okay. under the weight of, of, of public opinion, which has watched the carnage in Gaza and felt its revulsions at the terror attack of October the 7th and cannot help now but apply a form of scales, I suppose, to the proceedings. and, and yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's just basic mathematics to work out where that leads. Well, on, on the other side of that, though, you've got public committee in, in Israel, but, uh, yeah. because even though Netanyahu is not popular, what's happening in Gaza is yeah. popular with an overwhelming majority. There's even a sizable chunk who think it isn't going far enough. And, and Ben, ben Gavir, Itamar Ben Gavir, is speaking very loudly to them when he calls for an intensifying of the war after this Absolutely. revolution and striving with all our might at any cost. That's the line, there it is. At any yeah. cost. That's the point, isn't it? That's the Absolutely. point. Absolutely. That's and, the point that, that America and even more so the UK are not prepared to countenance, but which members of Netanyahu's government are, and increasingly they are prepared to say it out loud. And as you say, it doesn't necessarily come without public support at any cost. So there, there is not a yeah. death toll that would be too high, even though most people would probably accept that the goal is an impossible one to achieve. So it's an impossible goal yeah. with, 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 a, with, a, with an immeasurable cost. It's extraordinary that we've reached this place, but we have. And I think almost... It seemed at points that the kind of attitude was, if we kind of kick the can down the road long enough, yeah. this will solve itself because there just won't be any gardens left. I, 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 yeah, and, and maybe that's where the public opinion has stayed the hand of the, of the British and the American politicians, is that they, they can't sit by and let that... I don't know. I, I mean, we, it's possibly a speculation too far. Matt, thank you. Just speaking about the context, the background context, this is a poll from 2016, so it's it's not... New, but this is, and it was um, by Pew Research, published in the Times of Israel, found that nearly half of Jewish Israelis agree that Arabs should be expelled or transferred from Israel, and a solid majority of 79% maintain that Jews in Israel should be given preferential treatment, according to a Pew Research Center in Israel survey published on Tuesday. So I, I, the, the context, the background that Matt describes sometimes on this side of the world, we're not fully aware of um and and for example here here i'll read out a couple of the texts even the slightly less pleasant ones your naivety on us and uk abstaining uh, the uk didn't abstain but you tell me more about my naivety and the, and the un demanding a ceasefire has reached a new level of dot 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 irrespective of who is the pm of israel israel was always going to be alone and stitched up by the us Qatar and the Muslim world laugh at the West and their slumber. The pity is journalists, you included, are being played and choose to ignore true facts. To which my very simple response is, why won't they let journalists into the Gaza Strip then? I'll, I'll, I'll wait, shall I? If, if, if journalists are being played, why won't they let them into the Gaza Strip to report properly? Why can't Matt Fry go there with a the camera crew right now? I'll wait. Thomas Watts has the headlines. It is 25 minutes to 12. Uh, and uh, I guess the other element of what people like Itamar Ben-Gavir are saying, the, uh, described as a hard-line security minister, 
um, although that barely comes close. We, we must strive with all our might at any cost for victory against Hamas. I, I think some of these characters have forgotten to mention the hostages now. It's, 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 you know, whether or not they ever meant it, really. So many of the families of the hostages in Israel would, would dispute that the government ever cared particularly about their fate, but insisting that they did so as a cover for continuing to kill tens of thousands of people in, in Gaza, if that is what has happened, would have been uh, a very cynical tactic indeed. But certainly the quotes I've seen from Itamar Ben-Gavir, whose track record is, frankly, uh, it should have disqualified anybody from holding office in any country ever, but not in Benjamin Netanyahu's government. Um, he, he's now said, I mean, he's not probably said said before, but at any cost. So there's the answer to the question we've been asking since November, with how much is too much? And he says there, there is no too much, at any cost. So uh, the question of how it ends becomes um, terrifying, actually. The Times can write that it ends, the tensions between Netanyahu and Biden end when one of them leaves office. But that doesn't change anything on the ground overnight, moving forward. Gabby's in Barnet. Gabby, what would you like to say? Hi there. Um, I find it all quite depressing, to be honest with you. I'm not oh, professing to have all of, the, all of the answers here. Um, what I can't understand is, is there's been many sort of deals that have, that have been with using the US or Qatar recently, and, and it's openly been shown that many of them have fallen through due to Hamas. But what, I think the last one was that Hamas wouldn't even release how many of the hostages were dead. So whether or not, I mean, I'm sure there are other things that need to be taken into account here. But what I can't really understand is why yesterday the Israeli government, if they were actually smart, would just mm. sort of hit pause, embrace the resolution, put a ceasefire on the, con- on the condition of a full release of hostages, which is they mentioned the hostages. No, the UN, resolution, the, 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 the UN resolution doesn't mention the hostages. Well, then there is there is a problem there, but but essentially, and, and, nor, and nor does nor that's does Israel's clear. nor does Israel's security minister Itamar Ben Gavir. Well, that's a separate. That is a separate point. The point I'm making is is if they put the burden on Hamas to acquiesce to the release, which they won't entertain, it seems, and and sort of shedding light on They've been doing that from the start. They've been doing that from the start. You can't put the burden. The, the world won't wear that anymore. You well, they could if they put if they. If no, but they've been doing that from the start. The, the, the idea has always been: as soon as Hamas release all the hostages, we, we'll have a ceasefire. And then Netanyahu resiled from that position and said, even if they do release all the hostages, we're not going to stop. We're not going to stop well, until we've. Comp- the names they, can, of, they're not releasing the names of the hostages. Well, the, so, the, the so, reports so I've read. Well, I don't understand the point that you're making because you, you, you're jumping around quite a lot. Netanyahu has said that even if the hostages are released, we're not stopping. Well, I think if 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 it you was can't a you can't just government. you can't just glibly move no, no. on now because that that completely. <laughs> I think I think my, my it's not about moving on from anything. I think my point well, about well it about is because your point is built upon a fundamental misunderstanding of the facts. Really? Yes. There are many there are many many of the hostage of the deals which have fallen through because Hamas won't release information about the hostages. Is that uh, incorrect? Yes, it is incorrect. They're, one of the accounts of that is that they actually don't know. A lot of the hostages may not even be held by Hamas. And if all of the captives and and the hostages have been killed by an attack, who's going to know who's where? Do you buy that they don't know where any of the hostages are? No, I buy that they might not know where. I buy that they might not know where some of them are, and I don't understand why we're having this conversation in the context of the broader picture, which is about an Israeli prime minister saying that even if you release all the hostages, we're not stopping. My point was actually agreeing with you that that they that they what, what they should do is to stop. But but they they won't stop. For, and and they and in, and in so why fact, won't they stop? Are painting them in a worse light. Well, it can't get any they, worse than this. I, well, I think I they've got, I think they've got. I think they've just got themselves now into a situation where it's impossible for them to stop. I, I don't think why? they can. I I think Netanyahu is such an ego centric maniac at this point. Mm. I don't think he can go back on things. So I don't think he is he is the person that's going to stop. And I know that you said before, well, it will have to be Biden changing or Netanyahu changing for any difference to be made. But I can't see anything changing until Netanyahu's gone. And he has a very low approval rating. I, I think I read it was under 17 percent. When did you reach that conclusion? Which, which bit? About Netanyahu. Having a low approval rate. No, uh, having <laughs> been embarked upon a sort of a, almost a narcissistic course of... 
um, uh, ir- irreversible vanity? I think I think very very early on. Really? I think I think I think once it became very clear that getting back the hostages was not going to work, you know, hand in hand with with defeating Hamas, and it's very clear. I'm not some sort of war expert, mm. but I can't see how the two can work completely together. No, but, but really, they should have changed leadership then and there, but they won't, and they can't now. And I, I, I think they can't go. But I wouldn't put too much emphasis on everything Ben Kvir's saying, because the same, is he even in the war cabinet? I don't think he is. Well, he's the security minister. I'm not sure he's in the war cabinet, though. Uh, nor am I, but he is the, secu- <laughs> he, he is the security minister. So, you know, uh, it, it's a very senior position until, in the, in the Israeli changes, government. No, for sure, and he probably has more haters than lovers. He's unbelievably right-wing. And you know how this coalition works. The whole of the people that Netanyahu sits with, who allows him to prop himself up, don't share the same beliefs as him, but he has to just go with it. They're, they're dealing with loads Ooh. of other issues in Israel at the moment, and he has to deal with that as so, well. And, and so, in, I suppose it's the most obvious, and in some ways the most depressing answer of all. How does it end? I've got absolutely no idea. Absolutely no idea. Same here. Thank you, Gabby. Um, a friend, my friend Bella's been in touch, who, who has family in Israel and has helped keep me on an even keel throughout much of this um, conversation. She writes, the situation is heartbreaking, but it's been heartbreaking throughout. I do derive some optimism from yesterday's events. I can see a few routes now to a summer general election, whether through Netanyahu being forced into a ceasefire and his Jewish supremacist partners like Ben Gavir and Smotrich leaving the government as a result of the ultra-Orthodox conscription legislation, uh, so uh, complicated enough already, but all of this is pertinent as well, which is causing huge friction with his more moderate partners like Gantz and Azincott. My greatest concern is that Netanyahu will open a war against Hezbollah in the north for the reasons, essentially, that Gabby's just touched upon, that 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 would suit his personal self-interest, perhaps, um, more than anything else, and that would put my partners and siblings, as well as Israelis, in in a massive harm's way. Tragically, I wouldn't put it beyond him, sacrificing thousands of his own citizens, as he has done with the people of Gaza and with Israel's reputation, only to hold on to power. It's 11.42. Uh, Az is in Forest Hill. Az, what would you like to say? Hi, right, gents. Good morning. Um, yeah, your question is quite pertinent really um well, i hope so as i do my best mate every day i get <laughs> up I, I think to myself i hope as finds this one pertinent well uh, how does it end yes and you know you you really have to take a step back and and, and see this in a broader picture um and you know i know you you, you have the, the the notion or the view that the state of israel has the right to exist and then we you and i both know that Several states don't exist anymore because of political decisions. If Scotland decided to leave the UK, that's the end of the UK. If Northern Ireland decided to reunify with Ireland, that's the end of the UK. So states inherently don't have a right to exist. The people have a right to exist in peace and security, I would, I would offer. Okay. So that question just answers itself. As well, it, do, it doesn't, state... doesn't quite answer itself. And, and, I, and I don't know that this is... I don't know that this is logically sustainable, and I certainly don't think that it is historically sustainable, but I still feel that the shadow of the Holocaust puts Israel in a different category from any other country, including the ones that you've just described. Now, that's a very, oh, oh, that's yeah, a very personal we opinion. All the other countries that have had similar types of uh, atrocities committed against their peoples and have, you know, you can look at South Sudan, we can look at countries in Africa which were formed out of, no, you know, but, but, the, but, but but the but the pursuit of Jews everywhere in the world it's been horrendous on account of, on account of their yeah. religion demanded the creation of a haven where they would be safe and I don't think that that would apply to any of the other examples and, and, that, I, and I would accept that and, and, and you know, this is where you, well you, you have to you, you have to, we have to slow down a little bit because you you didn't accept it ten seconds ago you were glossing up or well, not glossing over but you were moving the focus to South Sudan and to and to Scotland and to Northern Ireland, I, I think, I th- and this is my personal conviction, right. that, that, that the that the status of Israel, when I talk about its right to exist, and you challenge that on, on, on the grounds that no state has that right, I disagree with you because of the Holocaust. And, and this is the problem that now with the current leadership in the government of Israel, they are causing that to be questioned. Yeah. Not not my opinion. And I, and I, I you know, reading a, a, a book by a, a, an Italian American uh, journalist actually who, who went to uh, the region. Alison Weir is her name. Her book is called Against Our Better Judgment. And just on the back of the book it says, after World War Two, uh, 
uh, several members of the uh, uh, statesmen of the United States of America warned that the creation of Israel on the land already inhabited by Palestinians would imperil both American and all Western interests in the region. Yes. Despite warning from you know the military and other pe- personnel in the, in the U.S. administration, so you see this conflict between the, the uh, executive in the United States of America and the executive in Israel yeah. because th- they want to have this uh, uh, continued uh, support for the state. But then you see what are other people no, saying but around but the world. But there's, two, there's two... I mean, I think you've led me to precisely where the problem lies. And it is that my conviction doesn't extend to excusing or supporting every single thing that Israel does. And that makes me a contradiction, doesn't it, As Because I can... No, exactly. So yeah. with these contradictions that we're all exploring, how can you... See, Joe Biden's election is in November. Yeah. What will happen between today and November if nothing changes? There will be more Palestinians killed. Yes. And how are people on the ground going to take that? There are going to be more protests. The governments are going to say, you can't protest. People are going to continue to protest wherever they are, wherever we are. That's going to continue to happen. Yes. And as we mentioned Michigan, your first call, I mentioned Michigan, I spoke to you about that before, the uncommitted voters. That's a political dynamic that you didn't you pushed back against the last time I spoke to you. That is going to play into Joe Biden's re-election campaign even more so. It will. Donald Trump has also come out and said what they're doing has to stop. Even though he still supports the state. But he, has, he hasn't quite state. said that. He's essentially, I mean, depending on how you read his words, you, you could say he's, yes. he's sort of given Israel, he's encouraging Israel to, to, go, to, to do what Ben Gavir is describing, to go in and, you know, reduce... The, the Gaza to a position of absolutely uh, no resistance to reduce Gaza, Gaza to, to, to to rubble, and then it would be over. So get it finished, I think, is what he said, or, which is not not quite the same as calling for a ceasefire. Well, so exactly. th- so that's that's yeah. the point. That's that's the problem. So, I mean, you're right, aren't you? Because either you either you say such is the unique status of Israel that its survival and its existence must be protected at all costs. And that makes you sound like, in a tiny little way, like like Gavir, like Ben Gavir, because he's used the phrase and, and, at and all costs to say what must be done to pursue Hamas. And and it is for me, and I hope this doesn't sound like a, a get out, but it's Netanyahu that's taken Israel to this place. It's not well, anybody I else. I, I, I think it's not just Netanyahu, it's everybody around him. And as Oh, for sure, whole, for sure. But just to hit him as the pilot, citizens. him as the pilot yeah. of the of the plane, well, that, of, of, of the course. ship that we're describing. Uh, but obviously, you've seen some of the polling that the ordinary citizens in, in, in Israel want there to be even more of what they're doing against the Palestinians. And Hamas. They want to go further. So removing Netanyahu, I don't think will yield the results that people think it would. Mm. And that's, that's I, 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 clearly, it would depend on who replaced him in the short term, but in the long term, you're probably right. I, I've not, I've not quite reached that uh, horn of dilemma before on my own. So thank you for for uh, for taking me there, because that's it, isn't it? You you you, you know, you, you comfort yourself or console yourself with the thought, because you look for certainty in these kind of conversations, and you think, well, the one thing I'm certain of is that Israel has the right to exist because of the Holocaust. But does that? mean that eventually you end up defending or supporting whatever Benjamin Netanyahu's government does and and logically it, it would and yet I'm not comfortable with that part of the equation on a lighter note as yes sir my, my friend Scott is listening to this program <laughs> in, in his t-shirt factory in Uxbridge his t-shirt shop in Uxbridge and he said that your voice is so deep you're making the card machine vibrate on the glass <laughs> counter <laughs> <laughs> James, you know what I'm going to say to that? I, I think people should listen to uh, uh, one of my favourite uh, 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 historical figures is Paul Robeson. His but voice. You want deep. <laughs> you, uh, you want deep. I'll give you, I'll give you deep. You take care. Thank you, As. It's coming up to 10 to 12. 11.53 is the time. Um, you know counterfactuals can be tricky. You know, Where is the line, do you think, between counterfactuals and whataboutery? So, so a counterfactual is, oh, imagine if that thing that's been done over there by someone you like or someone you don't like. Imagine if the same thing was being done by someone you do like or don't like, then would your reaction be the same? And it probably wouldn't. But but and then what about three is? Oh oh really? Yeah. Well, what my friend, my, the one I like's done that has he? Well, what about what the one you like's done? So what what about? What, but counterfactuals can be helpful. The Conservatives have issued an advertisement. Um, I, I think they've already deleted it, which is extraordinary for one reason, one rather obvious reason, which I suspect is the reason why they've uh, 
uh, why, why they've deleted the advertisement. But it, there's something else in it as well, which my colleague John Sopel has picked up on, that I, 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 it really speaks to the direction of traffic at the moment that is being followed by, by, by that party. And uh, whether or not Labour follows, I don't know yet, whether or not they decide to get as dirty. They've issued a couple of social media adverts that, that, that I felt personally were, were beneath um, uh, appropriateness, were wrong, just childish or, or, or silly, dressing people up as chickens. You've got, you've got to be good at comedy to do that. Um, but the but this this latest advert is extraordinary. I, I'll be talking to you about it a bit in the next hour. I, I don't know that we'll do a phone-in on it, but language and imagery that is either completely bogus or deeply dangerous. Now, commonplace, mainstream. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, back to the Middle East, back to the, the, the vexed question of what happens now, uh, or, or indeed, how does it end? And um, nobody knows, obviously, but the sooner we start talking about it, the better prepared we will be for the actuality. Shane's in Edinburgh. Shane, what would you like to say? Good morning. Hello. As you say, no one knows how this is going to end. It is just totally ghastly, but I... There's a few things I'd like to say. When that atrocity took place by Hamas committed that atrocity on the 7th of October, Mm. I've never forgotten Netanyahu's words. I accept he was upset, but he said very clearly and unequivocally, they will pay a heavy price. And I froze when I heard it and I thought, oh, my God. Did I'm you? Not, I didn't. Yeah, no, I did. I thought it made me, it filled me with despair and with what's played out. I was I was actually dusting my lounge. I was dusting the furniture, and I, I, I just froze. Okay. And I thought to myself, I thought, oh, my, now with what's played out, I don't think the hostages were ever honestly in the contemplation of Netanyahu and the Israeli cabinet. I don't for a second believe that. I just think they wanted to raise Gaza to the ground. And it, it, I agree with you. It is impossible to put Hamas out of business. And even the military wing of Hamas, I don't think, can be put out of business. And this not, not, go... not, not in this way. No, I, I not mean, in this way. It, exactly. We put the IRA out of business. Yeah. Yes, but not the. But you don't no, put Hamas out mostly. of business just by saying there's there's this network of tunnels all over Gaza and we're okay. going to bomb it to smithereens. But now that America has taken the stance that it has, and that the, that the Israel is now isolated politically on this, I think it's about time we had an honest debate about American aid going to Israel and. It basically, the United States bankrolls Israel. We need to look at a totally different solution in the Middle East. And I am not an anti-Semite, and I take great exception to Dame Maureen Lippman because I'm sympathetic to the Palestinian well, side. She's, she's, that she's, that I, she's, she's not here. So no, I, but she, no, she's not. But she has I'm said, not across what her comments may be, oh, so I'm, not really, quali- no, I'm right, not, not really qualified to adjudicate on this. But, no, no, but, but I can tell you quite... She said on Sky News last well, Sunday... Yeah, but now, I'm, now, you, now I have to take you your word for what somebody else said that I didn't hear and, and don't know about. Why, and also, why do we have to bring that into this? I'm trying to bring into the fact that as soon as someone takes a view, yeah. and I'm not anti-Semitic, my lay partner had a Jewish heritage, for God's sake. Um, but what is it that you're saying that you I'm think, because I don't need any lessons on being called anti-Semitic for expressing an opinion on the Middle East. Stop talking no. for a second. What, tell me what it is that you want to say that you worry will see you being accused of anti-Semitism, because as otherwise this you, is a pointless conversation. As soon as, some for some people in this debate... As no, soon as well, I'll ask you again. What is the thing you want to say that you think will see you get called anti-Semitic? I don't want to say anything that will get me called anti-Semitic, but there is a there is a school of thought that some I, I, people. I'm going to blow got... the whistle on you in a minute. So you've spe- you've you spent you spent fo- no. What, what is the say? thing that you are qualifying by saying I'm not anti? I don't know what the opinion is that you're sharing, Shane. Well, if you'd let me develop it, I can answer the question. Just tell me James. what it is. Dame Maureen Lippmann asserts oh. that if you disagree with Israel, you are anti-Semitic. See, I not. don't know that that's true, you, and, and, I, and I'm not at the moment prepared to take your word for it, which well, is why I was trying to steer you into a slightly more pertinent or, or plausible well, area of conversation. Because a lot of your callers... Yes, but I don't know that it's true, do I? So that, that, no, so When your callers ring up, James, a lot of them suggest that to disagree with Israel over this is anti-Semitic, and I don't I've never heard is. that. Well, I've heard it frequently on LBC. Not on this show, you haven't. Uh, may not, perhaps. Because they get even shorter shrift than you're getting now, mate. So the conversation that I didn't hear and now conversations that I wasn't part of. And you've used up four minutes of my show. 
at the end of an incredibly difficult conversation that was going, I felt, extremely well. It's coming up to 12 noon. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I don't know what we're going to do now. I mean, crikey, it's been heavy duty stuff today, hasn't it? But uh, there's a conversation about slavery that is very important. Uh, but there are some days, I don't know about you, I don't know how many conversations you've listened to about the, um, the, the role that slavery plays in the psychology of black British people. But there comes a point when for, for sort of aging white men like me to conduct yet another phone-in about it while pretending that all the other phone-ins we've had in the past have never happened. All you need to do is listen to people. Listen to people in the same way that I can talk about the role of Israel, the right of Israel to exist being intrinsically linked to the Holocaust. So you can talk about the black experience in modern Britain having intrinsic links back to slavery, can't you? Surely. Three minutes after 12 is the time. So here's what's happening behind the curtain. There's a conversation or a story that follows on from yesterday's report by, by Sarah Khan into harassment and, and intimidation and an attempt to make the... I always think, you know, whenever I hear a Tory talking about this, I think back to some of the stuff that Nadine Dorries tweeted and wrote about me. And I, I, I worry that perhaps they're not desperately sincere about uh, attempts to stop the harassment of, of people in either private or public life. Uh, absolutely extraordinary, libelous allegations made against a humble radio presenter by a very senior at the time politician, um, now reduced to writing in the Daily Mail about how men find her sexually attractive. I, I, you think I'm joking, seriously. Just don't, if you do, don't buy it. Just take my word for it. And yet the, the Tory party trying to dress itself at the moment in the clothes of the, of the guardians of of good manners and, um, and fair treatment. But the story I couldn't quite get my head around was um, one in four people saying that they've faced life-altering intimidation. I have no idea what that means, which is part of the problem. And the second uh, element of confusion I have with that story is what, what, what life-altering, I, I get the number. So what does life, what does it mean you, someone said something to you that was so horrible you've never forgotten it? Or does it mean that you've moved house? Life-altering intimidation. So we may dig a little deeper into that in the coming days. But as you can probably tell, I need to come to a slightly better understanding of, of, of what is going on. 27% of people um, surveyed, 27% said that they had experienced life-altering harassment with consequences, ah, I'm right, ranging from quitting social media to losing their job or, or moving house. So 27% of people have, have had life-altering consequences. How many of them have moved house? And how many of them have come off Twitter? <laughs> I'm not for a minute suggesting that it's not annoying to have to come off Twitter, but the headline, life-altering intimidation. And, and I'm almost certain that many, many people who've come off Twitter have had considerably less intimidation on Twitter than I've had. So, you know, one man's life-altering is another man's idiot's corner, isn't it? So I, I don't know that that headline is particularly helpful. But this one is, Majority of Britons support a formal apology for slave trade. Now, bizarrely, although possibly not bizarrely, given that I could pull on the... Uh, manage to bring the conversation about farmers protesting and Brexit into a conversation about Benjamin Netanyahu, the United Nations and Israel. And, and the, the abiding theme, the uniting theme, was that the question of how could you not see what was going to happen applies equally to both scenarios, um, to people who were initially supportive of Netanyahu and now sit um, by frustrated as he hemorrhages support from pretty much the entire world. And similarly, farmers who voted for Brexit, despite having it explained to them in relatively straightforward terms what was likely to happen if it was achieved. So what, how could you not see what was happening? I can actually bring this conversation about slavery. Uh, I can make it relevant to the conversation that we had in the last hour because I used to do this thing. And if you're relatively new to the programme, I, I, you, you may find this a little hard to believe, although I was certainly a bit more short-tempered than usual with, with, with our friend Shane in Edinburgh at the end of the last hour, so you may find it a little bit easier to believe than you, than you might otherwise have done. Um, I used to do phone-ins about the Holocaust, or, or, or we would perhaps be marking Holocaust Memorial Day. And I think to my shame... I would be impatient with people who rang in to remind me of the slave trade. And the reason why I would be impatient was because in my mind, one memory was much fresher than the other. And that, of course, is a, 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 in a sense, 
perhaps for a for a for an English educated white Brit, that is an almost chronological and historical inevitability. Uh, you know, we were taught a lot about the Holocaust in school. Most of us were certainly taught about the Second World War in general and the, and the Holocaust in particular. And we weren't taught much when I was younger about slavery, and it felt like a very long time ago. I mean, technically, there was only a hundred... If you take sort of the beginning of the 19th century, I think slavery was abolished in the UK officially in 1807. So if you, if you take this is the, turn of the, the turn of the 19th century, you're looking at less than 150 years, really, between a slave trade, a British slave trade, and and the Holocaust. So, if you're looking if you're looking at history from a from in a in a millennial term, as we will do in in two, three, four hundred years time, they were practically next door to each other. And yet, whenever I was doing phone-ins about um, about the, I'm only I'm giggling. Christine just texted to say, "Don't worry, James. Shane deserved it," and it just it just distracted me slightly from the moment. I fully appreciate this is not gigglesome territory that we're exploring at the moment there'll be plenty of people who think he didn't christine but thank you um so i would conduct the conversation and someone would ring in and say well, sometimes a little bit perhaps insensitively so somebody might say why do we always talk about the holocaust in this country and we never talk about the slave trade and i would be very impatient with them much more impatient than i just was with old shane in edinburgh and I, and, and, the re and I don't know why, looking back, I would be impatient. I think in my own mind, it felt as if it was a much longer period of time ago. I don't think I've got any kind of residual uh, uh, guilt. I've never understood why anybody is either rejecting or required to feel guilt about something that people from the same family or the same country did hundreds of years ago. But I'm, so I'm pretty sure that wasn't part of it. Um, and... I, I I suspect some of it was just prickliness on my part. If I'm having a conversation about Nottingham Forest and someone rings in and wants to talk about Millwall, I'd be like, well, who do you think you are coming on my show? But that's that's a me problem. That's not a you problem. So something else happened when, when, when we were doing this, and I think I know what it was. I think I reached, shall we say, my mid-30s as a, as a well-educated Englishman, and by Englishman, I, I simply mean I attended exclusively English schools. Very religious schools as well, remarkably. Um, Catholic, in my case, if you're interested. With a view of slavery that might have been up there with the Romans and the ancient Greeks. I, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but I am a victim. Not a victim. I am a product of the education system that I went through. I hadn't any concept of slavery as relevant to modernity. If, if I, at the very least, I would have had it filed under done and dusted. I know that racism existed, but racism was a very separate phenomenon from slavery. I would perhaps have argued if you'd pushed me to explain myself. And if you'd rung into a conversation about the Holocaust to talk about another Holocaust called slavery, called specifically perhaps the British slave trade, I would have encouraged you to move along because we're not doing that today. And, you know, come on, have a bit of respect. And I can't quite believe how wrong that was looking back, not just because of the dates, but also because of the obvious resonance. And... I hear now, you know, as, a, as an ageing white Englishman, I could sit here now and say, why should we have to apologise for a slave? I didn't have any slaves. I didn't have any slaves in Kidderminster. Why should I have to? My ancestors in, in County Wexford didn't have any slaves. They might have been sold as slaves. And there comes a point, doesn't there, where you realise that some people ask these questions and never actually listen to the answers. Some people, I presume it's a form of racism... Some people find the idea of a formal apology for the slave trade offensive and obnoxious because they think it would be a version of what Enoch Powell described when he described the black man having the whip hand over the white. I'm not apologising to no black person. They'll never say that out loud, especially the middle class ones. But that's what this is about. 
I'm not going to apologise for something that was white on black exploitation. I'm not going to apologise. Our society should not apologise to its black members for the way their ancestors were exploited by our ancestors. I ain't apologising to no black person. I'm white. That's all it. That's all I hear now. It's taken 20 years for me to get to this point, but that's all I hear now. Why should we apologise to, to, to black people for slavery? Well, the answer is bloody obvious if you take the time to listen. And there comes a point where you've asked that so many, that question so many times and you've heard so many answers that you can only conclude there is a very, very deliberate refusal to listen to any of them. So what I want to do today, we've done before and we'll do again, but we haven't done it as often as we should have done. And um, we will recognise... The modern reality. It's an Irish businessman, actually. He's, he's, he's no relation, I don't think, called Dennis, Dennis O'Brien. It'd be nice if he was, because he's worth a bit. And he has undertaken a, a, a poll released today on the UN International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, which should be revered and respected and marked with just as much solemnity and just as much seriousness as, for example, Holocaust Memorial Day. But it isn't, is it? I've only found this story in one newspaper today. But the survey has found that 56% of people polled said that an apology from the government itself would be welcome. 51% said an apology should come from organisations and companies which historically profited. 38% said an apology should come from the royal family. Now, there's some historical ignorance there. Because if you want an apology from anyone, it would be the royal family that you started with. I, I, I think it was, it was Charles II's brother, James, wasn't it, um, who, who basically started it. Not single-handedly, he had a lot of help. But um, the idea that there would be, there'd probably be no royal family these days without the slave trade, let alone Britain in its current form. But Dennis O'Brien puts it brilliantly. He's the founder of the Repair Campaign. And he says, it's hugely encouraging to see the scale of support in the UK for an apology. The government and monarchy can no longer afford to ignore calls for reparatory justice. The UK's extraordinary wealth was generated from free labour, free lands, and the highly profitable proceeds of slavery. So Dennis O'Brien is, is, is a white fella. So he sees it, as I see it, as a sort of historical and objective injustice. But if you were black... You're only going back, a hard, what, 200 years, 230 years, 250 years. We have families in this country who enjoy epic inherited wealth exclusively because their families, their beforebears, came over with William the Conqueror. They can trace their families back to the Doomsday Book, and they're very proud of it. And yet you tell black people in Britain that tracing their families back 250 or 300 years to, to the slave ships of the East India Company is something that they need to get over or stop carrying a chip on their shoulder. So I genuinely find it extraordinary. And of all the things we discussed together, I think this is the one, this is one of the ones I feel more strongly about as the years pass and the more that we talk about it. Partly because I hear people say, well, why should we apologise? Why should we apologise? And it's racism. It's just racism. It is a white person saying, why the hell should I, as a white person, apologise to this black person? I never had any slaves. It's, it's, it's ugly and it's crass and it's racist. And the reason why you know it's racist is that it has been explained so many times how the injustice of the past resonates with the reality of the present. How the simple knowledge... You know, when you study history, when you, when you look at a, an ancient artefact, when you visit a museum and, and you imagine for a moment yourself in that area, you imagine yourself in a toga in a Roman bath or you imagine yourself building a wattle and daub hut or you imagine yourself on, a, on, on the Mary Rose or you put yourself in that historical context. As a, as a white person, you're almost always going to be in a position of power. You wouldn't have been. It, it's why I always laugh at reincarnation. Everyone who gets reincarnated used to be Joan of Arc or Julius Caesar or Napoleon. No one was ever a bog washer or a, or a you know, a, 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 I don't know, a, a floor sweeper or a glass collector in a in an East End pub. Everyone was everyone was always somebody like really I've been I reincarnated. I was Genghis Khan in a previous Are you sure you were Genghis Khan? And not Bob Khan? The bottle the bottle collector from <laughs> So uh, we always imagine ourselves in positions of, of, of power. But if you were black looking back upon the eighteenth, the seventeenth century, and you were black British, who the hell do you imagine yourself to be?
So I think we'll do it again. I think we will do it again. And as Paige points out, the Holocaust lasted, uh, I mean, four years, according to Paige, I, I five. And the slave trade lasted for 400. So, and, and I will go straight to Idiot's Corner. This is Stork. Genuine question. Do you think the black people whose ancestors ran the slave trade will apologize for enslaving their own people? I, if you can find them, Stork, you can ask them. But the point about this project is that we know exactly who we're talking about. We know exactly which institutions profited enormously from slavery. A lot of them are still in existence. In the same way that in Germany, we know exactly which institutions and companies profited enormously from the Nazi regime because they're still in existence. If, if you want to go to Africa, Stork, and have a look for the descendants of the people that you think might have been responsible for selling their own uh, countrymen and women into slavery, then you can have that. You can launch that project, mate, if you think it's really important. But this project already exists because companies, institutions, royal families, governments, buildings, street names, statues, school names, community, everywhere you look, the vestiges of slavery remain. And so the question of whether or not people who live here today deserve an acknowledgement by way of apology for how these institutions and buildings and parks were built has absolutely nothing to do with your oh-so-clever point about the fact that black people in Africa were complicit in the slave trade as well. I'll tell you what, save yourself tempence and don't bother texting me to tell me that the Irish were enslaved as well. Who's going to apologise for that? Because what we don't know and what we need more of is the very simple understanding of what it's like to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. And that's why my phone lines are open. I am white. Lots of people listening to this have open minds. Some people don't. Some people's minds are so shut they could hear 100 people queue up to explain why slavery 200 years ago, 300 years ago is still profoundly relevant to the black experience in Britain today and they will never hear a single syllable of it and six months later they'll do another phone in about why the hell should we apologise but I'm listening and lots of people tuned into this programme are listening and you can tell them, that's all maybe even the moment you realised that it mattered you probably didn't take it from the cradle to the grave it would depend on your instruction at home wouldn't it but when you, when you suddenly, what's it like to realise What's it like to realise that the slave trade of a hundred, well, I beg your pardon, the slave trade of two, three, four hundred years ago is relevant to you today? Hit those numbers. Now you will get through. 03456060973 is the number that you need. That, that's the point. The, the word that I'm focusing on is not apology. The word is relevance. You prove the relevance, the apology becomes absolutely inarguable the relevance of the slave trade to your experience as a black Briton in 2024 just talk us through it because apparently we still really really need to hear 0345 6060 973 it's 1221 it is 24 minutes after 12 maybe we need to be a little bit more patient and, and presume that eventually the, the the message the lessons will will breach even the the thickest of carapaces, but the, but the media tradition of very privileged white people expressing unhappiness or skepticism or performative confusion about why there is an appetite, uh, not just among black people, but now among a majority of the whole population for a formal apology uh, uh, for, the, for the British slave trade um, is perhaps just one of those walls we have to keep building rather than complaining about the people who seem to be as thick as a brick. Missy's in Bermondsey. Missy, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, well, I was on a drive and I had to pull over because Good. I feel very, very, oh, safety first, I feel <laughs> very overwhelmed and I feel overwhelmed with happiness listening to you. Thank you so much because... I'm 36 years old. I was born in London. Um, my, both my parents were immigrants. My mum was from Brazil. My dad is Nigerian. Right. And I was born in London, raised in London, did my schooling, everything here, university. And I was always told by my mum and dad, you would have to work extra hard because you're black. And yeah. I never used to understand that. And as I've grown up, I, I now understand what they meant. I mean, even things like, you know, Missy is my nickname. I was given a very quote-unquote English name, yeah. And um, my last name is an English name, and I learned later on that that's 
through slavery as okay. to why I have the the surname that I have. Yeah. Um, and I was. It was the name of your ancestor's owner. Um, apparently, it's Beckley. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, you know, even my partner and um, he has the last name Kennedy, mm. and you know things like that. And we're black people. And I was also told. You know, the reason why I was given that name is because it would boost my job opportunities. Because um, when people would read foreign names on CVs, they sort of would throw them in the bin. And I just thought, gosh, I, I didn't understand it. And I feel like the acknowledgement, just you saying things that, you know, what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, the sheer ignorance that I haven't necessarily experienced myself, but I've seen people of colour, black people experience. It really is mind boggling, even though I'm a black person. And I think to some degree, I've been a little bit shielded and ignorant because I was born in the UK. Shielded, not not ignorant. But talk me through the, those moments of realisation, because I, I, for me, bizarrely, mm. I think it was a footballer. Okay, who had the surname of some lads I'd been to school with, and it, it, okay. it was it was a black footballer and. And that that was the first time I properly understood mm. that my school friend's family had probably yeah. ancestors had probably owned his ancestors and and mm-hmm. i couldn't get my i couldn't get my head around it and I think it was and forgive me if I misremember I think it was Kwame Kwayama, the the, the theatre director and and okay. actor who reverted to an African name right and that okay. and that just as a as an observer. Mm-hmm. Of this, the idea that the name you carry in the 20th and the 21st century is a nod towards the people that owned your ancestors, I found it, almost impossible to process. So God knows what it was like when when that penny dropped for you. Yeah, I was always very proud of my last name. And I think there was a couple moments. I'll just give you two quick ones. Mm. One was, I think I was on a school trip and we went to Canterbury in secondary school. And my name was called and this... Um, elderly white man very lovely man and he said to me oh that's not surely that's not your real name and I said well well yeah it is and I told my dad and my dad then sat down with me later on and explained that do you know what actually he doesn't even actually know what our original name would have been because this is what had happened Um, and to think that I always believed that my dad was from Nigeria originally apparently our surname goes even further to some another country in West Africa mm. called Sierra Leone. And then and my later 20s, I used to work at a very popular station, London Bridge, and I made an announcement over the tannoid. <laughs> and uh, again, an elderly white gentleman approached me, briefcase, you know, suited and booted. And he said, young lady, was that you that just made that announcement? I said, yes, sir. Sorry, did I make a mistake? And he said, no, you speak so eloquently. Um, were you born in this country? <laughs> And I thought, well, why on earth has he asked me that? And I I went home again, called my dad, because I'm very close with him, and I said, Dad, you won't believe what happened at work. I told him, and he just laughed. Because my dad's attitude to it, I think he's been in the country since he was about 18. He came over from Nigeria, and, you know, he went to university here, and so most of their lives, they they lived in England. And my dad said it was worse when we were younger. It's easy now, you know, and I just thought, it's crazy that people just freely speak like that. And and I, I, I sort of, I don't have any resentment towards anyone that's alive now because I understand that they are not responsible for what happened all those years ago. No, but that's the thing about institutions, isn't it? That's exactly. the thing about governments. It's not saying I, I who, who I don't think had any ancestral involvement in the slave right. trade. It's about um, acknowledging uh, that you benefit from that. Yeah. You, you, you do. Yeah, well, Let's we all we all I mean we all benefit from it exactly. in, in, in a sense in this country. But what it was built upon, mm-hmm. those people did not benefit from it. So, so what difference would it make? Do you yeah. think to you what difference would it make to you personally to have a formal acknowledgement? The thing that Dennis O'Brien and, and his colleagues in the repair campaign are are calling for a, a I, formal apology. I feel that the formal apology, as much as a lot of people, whether they're people of colour or not, mm. feel that it won't do anything i think it's the start of something i yeah. think the acknowledgement and just just like for example if you and i had an argument and i sat down with you and we spoke about it and i acknowledged how my actions have affected you or the actions of those before me has affected you that doesn't necessarily mean you're holding me to the fault but 
it just shows that I have an understanding. I may not get it because I've never suffered that. I've never been through what you've been through. But just having that empathy yeah. and acknowledging that, you know what, this was horrific. Just like the Holocaust, just like any other type of genocide or horrific thing that had taken place yes. in history. And I agree with you also when you said about the gentleman saying, oh, yes, but they sold their own people. That's fine. Yeah, but, of course. But it's just, you know, it's like passing the buck. When, right, when it's worse it than stop, passing the buck. It's water, but it's water boundary. So it's, it's, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I think it, it will be the beginning of something. Whatever that something is, I I don't know. I just think it's about it's just time progress. It's, not, it's progress. Exactly. You know which exactly. way you're heading in, even if you don't know where you're going to end up. That's it. And it's not swept under the rug. And we're not told, oh, get over it. It was so long ago. Well, yeah. you, you, well, I won't read out some of the messages that have come into the studio oh, for that gosh. for that reason. But rest <laughs> rest assured that they're, they're, they're in a very small minority, and um, they're not going to get a warm welcome bet- between uh, ten o'clock and one o'clock. Uh, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Missy, that was brilliant. Thank you. Amelia Cox has your headlines. 12.36 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I, I, continuing with this conversation, keeping an ear on the House of Commons where uh, a statement I think is being made about the uh, either about the resolution that was passed by the United Nations Security Council last night or, or, or more broadly about the continuing conflict in Gaza. But we, we continue with the conversation about the, just the relevance of slavery to modern Britain, particularly through the black experience. And with a tiny, tiny, tiny side order of hope that the kind of white people, particularly in my profession, who profess not to understand why acknowledgement and apology would help, might actually listen to the answers one day. One day. Kevin's in Finchley. Kevin, what would you like to say? So hi, James. So I want to bring in just an angle here, which is called generational trauma. Now, generational trauma is something that my Jewish brethren close to me will understand because the Holocaust has given a trauma that is handed down through generations. Okay, so we have exactly the same generational trauma. And a, a word that you guys used in the last conversation uh, was acknowledgement. Mm. And, aglo- and that acknowledgement is a key part of the um, kind of healing uh, that we are seeking. That acknowledgement that, you know, this horrific, horrific thing happened to my ancestors on the island of Jamaica. Um, my great granddad wasn't allowed to own land. So my grandmother um, still had to go to certain parts of the island and she wasn't allowed on certain beaches as a child. She was beaten because she went to the wrong beach one day. Um, My dad left Jamaica 19 years of age, went to work in the States and Florida and realized that he was too loud and proud and and stood too tall to be a black man. So thank God he left and came to London Mm. and met my mother. So that generational trauma isn't something from two, three, four hundred years ago. When these, you know, people want to say, "Well, get over it," it's not something that is so far away. And you know, I, I think that acknowledgement thing—it's it's almost like a, a, you know, it's shameful to acknowledge it. But no one wants to acknowledge that, you know, the British people could have done what they did. It's easy for us to look at the Holocaust because we can then point to the Germans and say, oh, the Germans were disgraceful. The Nazis were evil and we could never be like that. And we came and we saved them and we were good people. But we don't want to believe that the Brits could have gone over there. And I'm not going to talk about what they did to the Africans, but violated them. Um, for generations, you know, children born, and they were born into bondage, and they were, and the life, life, um, you know, expectancy during the height of slavery was around 18 years of age because they were worked to death. So this generational trauma is all we're looking for is acknowledgement, and that's it, and that'll be part of the healing. I, I, and because, well, not not just acknowledgement of the of the trade itself, as you've 
so perfectly explained, but acknowledgement of the legacy that reaches right into 2024. I, I, and, and that actually is a point perhaps I've not properly grasped before, because sometimes these conversations are conducted, particularly from the, oh, get over it, stroke, why should I apologize, school of thought. For, for the record, nobody's saying you personally should apologize. This is about institutional apology for institutional racist exploitation. But the idea that it was all over in 1807, well, we abolished slavery in 1807. What are you complaining about? But you never would have had segregation in, in America. You never would have had segregation on beaches in Jamaica. You never would have had any of the uh, uh, the, the microaggressions that, that, that exist today uh, without the backdrop, without the, without the, the spawning ground of slavery. Exactly. And look, I mean, the, the legacy is still, I mean, I'm glad you said that the legacy is still with us today. Mm. We Look, you know, we feel it because if you look at basic situations like education or ed, um, um, attainment in the UK, black Caribbean kids perform so much worse than, say, kids who are from African continental um, heritage. And the reason being is because those kids who are from you know, Nigerian homes, Ghanaian homes, they have a strong cultural backdrop to fall on. The kids from Jamaican families, you know, Barbados and Americas, we are still culturally lost. We don't know our language. We might have a Scottish surname. So, you know, there's so much that, mm. that, that trauma. There is an actual, you know, that has actually him, you know, it, that has limited us. And I'm not saying that we can use that because look, I, I do quite well. I have a master's oh, degree. I, I know so, but I'm saying the average you know, an, an educational attainment level, there is a real challenge that needs to be resolved. Um, and that generational trauma is, is part of a problem. Beautifully put, Kevin. And I, I'm sure you'd join me in recommending a Carla's work if people want to read a little more into some of the areas that that, um, that Kevin has touched on there, an extraordinary communicator. Um, I, I, and, and I'll address this one as well, if I may, from Alex in Kingston. I know you asked ask, ask the question in very good faith. And it's a good question. What's the point of apologising for slavery when we have racists donating £15 million to the governing party? And I think the answer is that a lot of people don't realise how awful that is. And you don't have to be white not to realise how awful that is. Cammy Badenoch called it trivial, I think. Uh, so a lot of people don't understand how awful Frank Hester's behaviour was, the, 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 the words he made and the um, uh, dreams he expressed about Diane Abbott. And he has gone unpunished. And in fact, his offence has gone un unacknowledged largely as a consequence of the sheer scale of the amount of money that he's been pumping into Tory party coffers. So the, the answer is that more people would find it easier to understand how awful that was if there was a better understanding of what Kevin has just described, Alex. I think, I, I'm possibly being a bit idealistic, but I'd rather be idealistic than not. Um, uh, I don't know what the opposite of idealistic is. Nihilistic, possibly? So that, there's your answer. It's precisely because people like Frank Hester are still, you know, riding high in this society, that the acknowledgement of the reality that built it somehow excuses the racism of someone as rich as him. He's literally having his racism excused because he's very, very rich. So I, I couldn't be more pertinent to a conversation about acknowledging the legacy of slavery. So thank you for that question. Uh, Owena is in Caversham. Owena, what would you like to say? Hello. Hi. Hey. First time caller. Welcome Not nervous. Aboard. Oh, don't be. It's only me. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that being a, I, or I'd like to use the colour black because an identity of where I come from, I have no idea. Yeah. But growing up in England and growing up in a very national front environment and area, I found that I was constantly being told to go back to where I came from. Going back to the Caribbean, yeah. um, being colonialised, I found that I wasn't accepted there either and was called an English girl. Obviously, having no roots f to Africa, I find myself sitting on the fence, um, which my mother always told me I would be. Um, having no home, having no place to say where I belonged. Be because people here tell you or did tell you constantly that this isn't your home. So even though it is, you can't feel it in the way that, for example, I can. Yes. Yes. And that is a legacy. That's a, that's a, that's a modern resonance. That's a 21st century echo of what was going on in the 17th century. Yeah. So, thank you. 
Thank you. Just the point I would like to uh, well, clarify uh, I, as, I like as it's continuing, you know, it of does course. feel that way. Yeah. It's beautifully thank put. You. Uh, no, well, thank you. I like that. I, I just uh, always welcome to, to be as brief as you want in contributions to the programme, especially if they're going to be as pr- profound as awareness. And of course, Christopher's just reminded me that one of the defenders of Frank Hester was defending him on the grounds that he couldn't possibly be racist because he'd done business in Jamaica. I'll let you have a little think about that for a moment. <laughs> 12.49 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. David in Tamworth puts it very well indeed. Too Jamaican to be English, too English to be Jamaican. And it's a, it's a condition caused entirely by the slave trade. It's a, it's a condition describing someone alive today that is a consequence of things that happened then. And uh, for, for, for white people, the concept of generational trauma is very easy to accept for our society. But for black people, there is resistance. Even now, in 2024, you don't have to venture too far to find people who will scoff at the notion of institutional apologies for the slave trade, whether from the government or, or the royal family or, or, or industry. And they'll pretend not to understand it by saying, why should I apologize? I didn't have any slaves. A deliberately attempt at pretending not to understand it, which is, of course, a form of racism because you are deliberately discriminating against the victims of this practice on the grounds of their colour. No, nobody would ever uh, question the need for profound reflection upon and apology for other holocausts. But when they've been visited upon black people, they become talking points or phoning topics or, or, or conversations, debates. Not here, not on this show. There's no debate here. It's completely necessary. Still necessary, sadly, and uh, profoundly important. 12.51 is the time. But on the grounds that some people still need um, reminding, then we'll continue to canvas the reasons why. MJ's in Shepherd's Bush. MJ, what would you like to say? Hey, James. I think, first of all, I talk about how I am a young black man with Australian, um, partially Aboriginal and Jamaican heritage. And for both of those cultures, for me, they are incredibly out of reach to ever feel connected with or Mm. ever understand my history, the the cultures, the, the songs, the traditions. I will never be able to find or identify with any any of those aspects of my being for me is in you know is you feel lost within yourself when you try to figure out and going through i'm 19 at the moment just going through the stage of figuring out who i am and where i want to go and to not have that basis to not have the the starting point yeah. of a very big part of my identity it is really losing but i think a more pertinent point to talk upon is that um in australia on the 26th of May, we have this thing called Sorry Day, yes, which is the attempt of a national apology to apologise for the brutal murder, uh, disenfranchisement, displacement of millions of people from their home every year to come out and say, I'm sorry for all that we've done. But what really is an apology without action yes. other than words and just to make ourselves look better you know well i i i, I don't i'm not going to argue with you because your, your point is ir- irrefutable but i can perhaps answer a question that was intended to be rhetorical and and that is that i think the subtext of what you're saying is that uh, exploitation discrimination of of aboriginal people in australia remains rife and and therefore what use are all these sorries. But do you not think that if we think of things as incremental rather than immediate, people stop and think about it? You know, for every Yahoo there is screaming racial abuse from their Twitter account or a street corner, there'll be somebody else sitting there thinking, what are we apologising for? What happened? And they'll find out more as a consequence of this practice. And that chips away at the, at the, at the thing that we're both describing. No, or am I no, sounding very naive? No, definitely. I think that starting the conversation mm. for any social political problem is the basis of creating a solution for it. But I think within this first conversation, we should also be looking at future reparations and providing support for the people who are still constantly affected by slavery, not just within yeah. our own nation, because we're privileged enough to be like, okay, cool, an apology will work. I 
we're getting jobs. Things aren't as discriminatory, but for all the people still in West Africa, all people in the Caribbean who still every day face the effects of their land being pillaged, their resources being taken for them not being able to get jobs for when we come into the Niger Delta and set up oil plants and people have to resort to piracy to just get by to just provide for their families. These people are still being constantly affected by slavery. And yes, an apology is good and it's a starting place. But, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it is really just a starting place. It's, a, or, it's, or it's not a even the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You, you, you've just frozen a couple ice cubes and thrown it in the <laughs> And like, really, what are we achieving here other than it makes us feel accepted, but just feeling... Well, not even accepted, feeling no. like we're being heard, you know. But that's it's interesting. You're the youngest. You're the youngest caller today, I think, by probably by ten years or so. And 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 you come at it from a different perspective from some of the older callers, for whom for whom the resonance of or the legacy, if you like, the domestic personal legacy was was profound in a way that you see you feel differently. I think you just feel it as a form of dislocation or 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 a, or, or a, a, a feeling of disconnection from I, your past, your heritage? I think it's, it's something that I think always as we go through generations, I think the younger generation always has the clearer eyes. They haven't been burdened by living through the system as harshly Imagine. or as um, or as fully as it. And we, we can see where the wrongs are done because, you know, come with a new threat fresh pair of eyes to a situation you can see where things are going wrong and where things have been done wrong uh, but That's but for I'm... goodness sake don't fall in and i think this is why you mentioned sorry day don't fall into the trap of thinking that the job is done the mission is accomplished when you've put a few potentially platitudinal um projects in place to to, to address at least with words and words alone a, a historical injustice mj thank you I hope, I hope to talk to you again um david is in guildford david what would you like to say oh hi james yeah um nice little link with that previous point and the, the message you just said about words alone are not are not important um, my, my, I've only got a couple I mean, of minutes David just to warn yeah, I'm you I'm a little bit infuriated about the idea that if you don't apologise for racism you're, you're, you're racist and a racism uh, sorry a state's, um, slavery was abhorrent it's, it's a stain on anybody that was involved uh, surely the greatest thing from here that we could take from this is to learn from it to understand it, to accept that it's it was a brutal thing to have done and, and it never happened again. What, what benefit is an apology from Rishi Sunak or Kate Middleton? Well, you've, I mean, just, you've just had an you, hour of people telling you. Wait, 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 what well, did you hear that you disagree with? Well, I, I, I took exception to... I don't. I am. I am not a racist person. Um, uh, that's what racists you, always say. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah. Um, so just no. It's a simple question. You've just heard an hour of people answering your question completely directly. What What did you hear that you disagreed no, with or, I, or struggled I heard, with? I heard the dislocation. I heard the. Um, so what did you struggle uh, with that you heard? What did you I disagree with? with? What difference is somebody who wasn't involved? But they've told you it's institutional. Well. Is it? Is the government institutionally racist? Is the royal family institutionally racist? Is Unilever institutionally racist? The the, the I, benefits I that they enjoy today are, are a consequence of the institutionally racist practice of slavery. I don't want to be rude, but if you haven't understood this by now, I don't think I've got uh, the that skill. That is rude, James. No, that it, is rude, you can't. James. You can't say um, it's rude until I finish. You don't want to be rude, but if I don't understand well, by now, I don't think there's anything I can say that will help. Well, fair enough. Okay. Because you've chosen not to understand. But one thing we I've can both... I've chosen not to... Whoa, whoa, you whoa, whoa, have, because you've just whoa, whoa. heard an hour not. of explanation and you've chosen not to understand any of it. But we can agree on one thing. We can agree on one thing, can't we? Well, we you, can agree that it's yeah, abhorrent. you're definitely yes, not absolutely. racist. <laughs> James, well, you try and paint me as I am, but... Mate, I'm just um, repeating your own words back to you and agreeing with you completely. I, I, you've listened to this hour of radio where black people have explained the resonance and importance of slavery and the value of acknowledgement and apology in the 21st century for things that happened in the 16th, 17th and 18th, and you don't see the point of it. So I, 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 okay, I, I can't help you understand. That, I can't help you understand any more than, I, than they can, but we can at least all agree that you're definitely not racist. 
It's 12.59. You have been listening to James O'Brien. If you missed any of today's show, you can... Li- well, I mean, I, or not, as the case may be, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now, standing in for Sheila Fogarty, I know the face. <laughs> <laughs> I know the face. I can't quite... It's a Matthew something. It's, it, it is uh, the inimitable, the one, the very only Matthew Wright. I'm 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 the very only. 